We'll talk about all of the Fallout games. Fallout 1, Fallout 2, Fallout 3, and Fallout 4. And that's it. Oh, I didn't realize New Vegas had oh, been yeah, excommunicated. Sorry, I, I forgot about New Vegas. New Ve- Actually, okay, let me let me redo that. <laughs> and Brotherhood of Steel. No, that, that doesn't exist. And all the other spinoffs that neither of us have that played. Actually, I've never played them, so I, I have no right to say whether or not they exist because I haven't, I've only watched other people play them and been like, wow, this looks like hot trash. Yes. Let's start in... At the beginning. Yes, let's start in sequence. Fallout 1. Have you played it? Uh, I have not played a Fallout 1. I've played, like, little bits of it. I've played, like, the beginning of it. And then that was about it. And I think I played the beginning of it back when... No, I don't even remember remember when I played it. We'll go with no, I've not played it. (laughs) You haven't played either of the isometric games? No, I haven't. Okay. So you can't really give your opinion on them. It's just gonna be me. Not really. I watched your playthrough. Oh, you, you didn't watch the entire thing, did you? I think most of it. Okay. Of one and two, though? Yeah. All right. It's been a while since I played those. Yeah. I played them once just because, you know, it's Fallout, but it's not my kind of game. It's basically a different genre, and it's not my genre. It's very difficult for me to go back and play old games if I haven't played them before. Yeah. It, the story might hold up, but honestly, there, we've had so many technological advances when it comes to gameplays. I remember when games start first started doing like trigger controls for shooting. Mm-hmm. That was revolutionary. Yeah, that was like the PlayStation Three generation and uh, Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. Like that I generation. There, I think there were some PS Two games that that did that. There were, yeah. there were, but it wasn't standardized at that point. It wasn't yeah. until the next generation that it kind of became standard that you aim with L and shoot with trigger R. Yep. But so, th- that's just an example of how things weren't standardized, and it was the Wild West back in the day, and that made for Plenty of innovation, but it's it's difficult to wrap your head around how those games work. Yeah. Why don't you talk about Fallout 1? What I, is the story of Fallout 1? I don't want to spoil it for anybody who wants to play it for themselves, but I'll give you the rough overview. You're, you're a vault dweller and your water chip is not functioning properly. What, what is water chip? Yes, the thing that makes purified water for your vault so we can stay isolated from that's, the outside world. That's not a chip, though. That's just a water purifier. Yes, but it uses a special chip. Oh, so the, the circuit board for your water purifier is busted. Yes. Busted AF. Mm-hmm, and you need to go to a, another vault and find a different replacement chip. And you need to do it... Quickly, because if you don't, your vault will die of dehydration and everyone will die. Isn't there actually, like, a time limit in the game? Yes, one of the biggest criticisms of that game, besides how outdated it can feel, is the uh, strict time limit. Because if you're not fast enough, then many people will die. Not just people in your vault, but there, there are a lot of cities that are on a time limit, and if you don't deal with their problem, then they just die. It could, ha- it could just so happen that they die before you even know that they exist, which can be kind of frustrating. What do you like about Fallout 1? I like how simple it is. It's not overly complex. There's honestly only about four or five settlements. It's a very short game. So even though it can be difficult to play, it's also not terribly lengthy or overburdened by unnecessary faff. So it it can be short and fairly simple. I mean, I'm pretty sure a speedrun of that game is like five minutes. Probably. It's, It's not very long. But it set a lot of the precedent for the series that we love. It had vaults, and it had Brotherhood, and it had mutants, and it it had... had, It had bottle caps. It had caps. Yeah, it had had all the minutia that we all love today. It actually had a pretty compelling story. It had some good role-playing aspects and some attributes with that. A great final boss, perhaps the best final boss out of any Fallout game. Isn't the final boss the master, or is the final boss the, the Enclave? The final boss is the Master, and the final boss of Fallout 2 is the Enclave. Okay. So maybe you're getting those confused. Yeah, I was getting those confused. I couldn't remember which one was which. Yeah. So yeah, the final boss is the Master, basically the thing that created the super mutants. Mm Mm-hmm. The good thing about that boss is you don't have to fight him. If you know about him, you could, could blow up the entire base without ever talking to him, or you could talk him down. So there's three main ways you could deal with him. Fight him, which is are going to be a real challenge of your combat skills or talk him down if you found the requirements or just blow the entire facility and run like hell. Yeah. Which is great. The first one takes place in California, yes? Yes. And then so does the second one. Correct. It takes place in the exact same location, I think, 80 years later. 
So in the first game, you rescue Tandy from the Raiders. And then in the second game, you find her 80 years older, leading the community. And there are a couple of characters that are in Fallout 1 and 2. You see them again. They've changed a bit in the last 80 years or so. I mean, it is 80 years later. I would think they'd be dead. Ghouls live forever. People that are only 10 years old would be 90 years old, so they wouldn't be dead. It's a post-apocalypse. It's not like there's health care. The NCR does good stuff at, at this point in time. Uh-huh. Yeah, I bet. They definitely haven't stretched their resources at the breaking point like they have in future games. What don't, not to rag on it too hard, but what don't you like about Fallout 1 other than the fact that it's clunky and it has a time limit? Well, Fallout 1, as I've said, is very short, which is in some ways to its benefit. But at the same time, not only is the gameplay kind of archaic, that isometric turn-based kind mm -hmm. of thing, which I personally don't care for. Some might, but I don't enjoy it. So I'm kind of hoping that it gets ported either by the company or by fans to the modern systems. Fallout New Vegas' engine was being worked on for a while. I think there's some projects for Fallout 4. I'd love to see those being completed. And I think Fallout 2 would really do well from the transition to modern engines. But Fallout 1 is actually sh so bare bones that it would be noticeably shallow if it were ported. Like, th for example, in the first area, the first city you go to, Shady Sands, only has basically one quest. Kill some scorpions nearby. That's it. That's the only actual thing you can do in the town. You, you can talk is to people, you can trade, you can pick up a companion, but there's nothing you can actually do. Isn't Shady Sands the capital of the NCR? It's not yet the capital in this game. Ah, okay. It becomes the capital. Right. You save the town from the Scorpions and the Raiders, and you rescue Tandy, and then it becomes the capital of the NCR, and Tandy becomes the president. But there's only one quest to do there. There, that I mean, technically two. I mean, you kill the Scorpions, and then you bring one of the Scorpion sacks to a guy who wants to make medicine out of the Scorpion sacks. That's it. Fantastic. So like I said, if you brought it into modern day systems if you ported it to fallout 4 it would be notably shallow and you'd have to add more quests more content more things to do and more people to talk to i think that's pretty much all i have to say about that game like i said that's it's it yeah there's not that much to say about it i guess nope uh fallout 2 right and the sequel the much anticipated sequel to i i will how the fuck did this get a sequel <laughs> like, yeah who who was i i realized that you know now again wild west it's kind of the same thing i look at like warcraft the original one i played warcraft i loved warcraft but now like looking back at it, it's like the fuck did i like this game <laughs> this is awful i hate this yeah well, it's fun to click on an orc over and over and hear him go zug zug <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all it is that's the only reason yep. that's the only reason join the navy they said see the world they say. if you click on the human boats enough times they start doing stuff like that I'll take your word for that. Yeah, it's really it's really fun. You can click on human units enough times and they're just like, stop clicking on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I could give you a more detailed analysis on Fallout 2, but I've only played through it once. And because there is so much more to that game, I feel like I missed half the things. I know the super mutant named Marcus, who you do meet in, a, in New Vegas, is oh, in that yeah. game. But I never met him. I well, didn't meet him and I didn't meet a bunch of other characters that I know are in that game. And I think... I think Cass's dad is in. Yeah, he's a companion. Two. I found him. Yeah. Yep. He's in two. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of crossover between two and New Vegas. Well, New, yeah, New Vegas made a bunch of references to that, which game. I which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but two is another top down isometric game. Why don't you give me the plot of Fallout Two, Mike? I'll tell you everything I know about Fallout Two. Uh, it's basically Fallout One, but with stuff in it. Okay. Uh, the plot of Fallout 2 is instead of your vault needing a water chip, it's your village needing a Garden of Eden creation kit. A gek? Yes. You need the gek because all the crops are failing and you need something that can make plant life blossom. It starts off as a pretty simple quest to go find the gek for your community and then it spirals into something bigger as you realize there's a bigger threat that's threatening the entire wasteland. And then you deal with that. Something I think we should probably mention is that Fallout 1 and 2 are turn-based. Fallout 1 and 2 are turn-based, which makes VATS make a whole lot more sense. Yes, the history of VATS is tied to the turn-based aspect of the original games. A lot of people like VATS, and I'm not going to begrudge them for putting it in. It does seem like, if nothing else, a bit of an accessibility feature for people who aren't good at shooting games. So I'm glad they included it as an option. 
but I do not like things that interrupt my gameplay. I don't like having to go into menus to pick a different gun. I don't like it when time slows down and I can very gently select the body apart. I want my character to shoot. I just want to do the shooting. That's just personal preference. Again, I don't use VATS. Counterpoint, you play Valkyria Chronicles where you're constantly interrupting shooting. This is a totally different game genre. How dare you, sir? It's a third person shooter that has turn-based elements. It, it's a turn-based shooter. <laughs> So yeah, they're turn-based games, and they are, like, actually turn-based. Yes. You, um, you do take turns. You have to wait for your opponent to make their move. There's a lot more to do in that one. You can become a made man, joining gangs, become a porn star, get drugged, meet somebody who invented jets, recruit a half-dozen companions, fight the Enclave, get killed by the Enclave, find these local settlements. Some are raised by ghouls. Some are raised by super mutants, I think. Join the NCR. Join the NCR, see the settlement that they've made, get kicked out of the city built around a vault. There's a lot of stuff in that game. And then the final boss is Frank Corrigan. You go meet the president of the Enclave, and you go fight his behemoth of a man, Frank Corrigan, this 20-foot-tall man who tears into you. It's got some fun moments. I could have a lot of fun with that if it were ported to modern systems. But again, I I have a lot of difficulty going back to those old turn-based games. Aren't there multiple endings to Fallout 2? There are multiple endings to both Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. I like, thought Fallout 1 only, only had like no, two no, endings. Like I said earlier, if you don't deal with problems in a timely manner in Fallout 1, they will just burn the entire thing down. Ah. So there are multiple endings. You either deal with the problem before it explodes or you don't. And there's a good ending and a bad ending for everything. Maybe a few more endings, but there are definitely two endings for a lot of places. And that carries over into the second game. What is your favorite thing about Fallout 2? Uh, It's been so long, it's it's difficult for me to remember everything about that game. Hmm. So again, if I were playing it on a more modern engine, I'd probably be able to remember a lot more about it. There could be a lot of fun moments of a spectacle, like when you fight the, the Frank Corrigan boss on the Enclave oil rig, or when you explore Vault 15's city, I believe. I like how there's a lot of stuff to do, and I feel like I overlooked a lot. And I kind of want to go back to play Fallout 1, but at the same time, I know I've already done everything there. There's not going to be anything new. Mm -hmm. But I know if I go back to Fallout 2, there's a bunch of stuff I missed, and I didn't join this other gang because some of those are mutually exclusive, and I didn't do this and this and this, and there's a bunch of stuff that I overlooked, a bunch of stuff I could go back and do. So it's got replayability, which Fallout 1 really doesn't have in spades. What don't you like about Fallout 2? Uh, Basically just the engine. Okay. Fair enough. It's mostly just the engine. You bring that game into a modern engine and I'll play the hell out of it. One of the things, this is tangentially related to Fallout. One of the things that I keep hearing from people is you have to play this game. It was cre- It's made by the same guy that made the original Fallout. Mm-hmm. Or you have to play this game because it's more like Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. And it's, I don't, I don't necessarily want to play a turn-based isometric top... I know there are people out there that are that are diehard fans of Fallout 1 and 2, and that will say that 1 and 2 are the best ones <laughs> out of all the Fallout games. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I, I get a lot of I get a lot of people telling me that I have to play this game or I have to play X or Y game because it's more like Fallout 1 and 2. And I, I'm kind of just like, what leads you to believe that I want to play Fallout 1 and 2? Are there any games in particular you're thinking of? Um, I think one is like Wastelanders. I hear people mention Wasteland 3 a lot. Yeah, Wasteland 3. I played Wasteland 2 and it bored me to tears. They say Wasteland 3 is significantly better, but at the same time, it's probably not my genre. Yeah. It's- if I don't like eating potatoes, why would I like eating a potato with butter on it? Yeah. Well, it's better. It's, it is better, but... It's the same thing improved. It's and not, I don't like the original thing. Yeah, it's just a different genre and a genre I never got into. I don't like it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I will never play those games or that those are bad games by any means. But it is It is kind of like... What does this have to do, what does this have to do with my original point? Anyway. <laughs> I think your point here is... Just because we like Fallout New Vegas doesn't mean we like Fallout 1 and 2, and that doesn't mean we don't like the Wasteland games and games like it. Yeah, I I don't know. Just I'm not your fucking dad. Like, don't listen to my... Make your own opinions. Would you like to officially state that Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 suck? 
No, I'm not saying that Fallout 1 and 2 suck. Do it. People love drama. No, I, I, no I'm not saying that. I'm okay. not trying to get fucking canceled. Canceled because you didn't like this 30-year-old isometric How game. How dare you? <laughs> anyway, let's... Let's move on to the next Fallout game. Yes, which we're going to ignore everything that's not the main we're series. We're going to ignore Fallout Tactics because that is widely regarded as trash. Yeah, I played about an hour of it. It's not good. So Fallout 3. Fallout 3 is the first Fallout game I ever played. It was the first Fallout game I ever played as well. It introduced a lot of people to the series. What was your introduction to Fallout 3? Because I know what my introduction was. I think I've talked about my introduction to Fallout 3 before, and it wasn't a very pleasant one. I found this game called Fallout 3 at a GameStop, and I said, ooh, new PlayStation game. It's the third one in the series, which means it's got a storied history and must be good at this point. So I took it home and put it in, and I got through the vault sequence, character building, the escape from the vault, and I found myself in this giant open world, and I think it was the first time I've ever been in a giant open world where you could go anywhere and do anything, mm -hmm. and I didn't understand. <laughs> and I found a way to Megaton, and I I couldn't figure out what I was doing, and I found Moira, and she said, go to the supermarket and get food. And oh, I, my God. And I did that, and I couldn't because I kept getting shot at by raiders, so I went back to town. And then I talked to the Burke's man. Is it Burke? Is it's it? Burke, I think. Okay, I, I talked to the man named Burke, and he tried, he tried to get me to blow up the town, and I snitched on him to the sheriff, and the sheriff came into the bar and said, I'm going to arrest you, Burke, and then immediately 180 and let Burke shoot him in the back of the head. Yeah, the sheriff wasn't very smart. And then Burke said, how dare you? I'm going to make sure you pay for this for snitching on me. So I shot him to death. And then either the townies weren't happy about that or maybe some collateral damage got caused, but I got chased out of the town and I went, okay, you know what? I'm just going to reload from an earlier autosave but it had auto-saved after I'd left the bar and after I'd been vilified by the town. And I didn't know vilification goes away after three days at that point because this is the first time I played a Fallout game. I didn't know it goes away after three days. Yeah, so I got chased out of the town and I thought, well, I guess I can't go back to Megaton ever again. I And uh, that's where I need to go to actually do the quest, so I have no idea where I'm going. And so I just started walking and I walked in a direction for probably a good 10, 15 minutes without ever encountering anything. Just nice. into a random direction, didn't find anything. And then I got murdered by raiders, and I said, I'm done with this. I, I'm not going to play this game anymore. This game sucks. What a fun game. And now we have a career playing the sequel to that game. I didn't play that game for two years, at which point I gave it another chance, and I actually beat the hell out of it. Yeah. Yeah. My first introduction to that game was I it was when I was in college, and I went downstairs, and my friend Ian was playing Fallout Three and he was specifically I remember was playing the Mothership Zeta DLC. Oh yeah, yeah. So my introduction <laughs> to Fallout was the Mothership Zeta DLC. <laughs> that may have colored your perception. And he was like, "Yeah, this is awesome." And I was like, "This looks awesome." And there's a bunch of aliens running around and he's shooting them. He's like, "Check it out, there's a samurai over here. He only speaks Japanese." And I was like, "Fuck, this game slaps." <laughs> I, I didn't say that. I think I said this game rules because this slaps wasn't uh, part of the vernacular. Yet. No, this is totally tubular. This is the bee's knees. Boy, this sure is the bee's knees. What a humdinger of a game. Uh, yeah, I thought it was freaking awesome. So I went out and bought it. And man, I had, a, I had a lot of fun playing that game. Even though there weren't aliens in the base game. No, there weren't. I, well, I didn't get to the Mothership Zeta DLC later. And then when I did get to the Mothership Zeta DLC and played it for myself, I was like, oh man, this sucks. I hate this. <laughs> did you? I hate, the, I hate this. This is not fun. And I went and talked to Ian and I was like, yo, that part sucks. And he's like, yeah, I had just started playing it. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> I got real sick of running around in the space station. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So why don't we talk about the DLCs later? We'll talk about the base game first. We'll talk about the base game first. Despite the fact that you couldn't aim down iron sights. Yeah, that is a problem. I really liked Fallout, Fallout 3. Yeah, it was good for its time. For its time, it was a very good game. Yeah, I really enjoyed playing Fallout 3 uh, when it first came out. I thought it was a great game. The very beautiful, empty atmosphere, the haunting spectacle of it all, exploring a destroyed world, seeing the ruins of the apocalypse of the pre-war world crumbling to dust. It's a great setting. Fallout 3 was like my introduction to exploration games. And it was how I learned that I really like playing games where you just walk around and explore shit. <laughs> 
in some ways, it feels to me like the spiritual successor of 3D platforming games, games like Super Mario 64 or Banjo Kazooie, those games where you're exploring these giant colorful worlds, bouncing around, having fun, and you can go anywhere and do anything. It's kind of like that, only a more adult version of it, with darker tones and gunplay and the spirit of wandering around, seeing something off in the distance, going, I have no idea what that could be. I'm going to go check it out. I want to see what that thing is. Um, Games that reward you for going into the darkest corner and turning over the rock and seeing what you could find. Fall 3 has a lot of really memorable moments, too. Yeah, it's got some spectacle to it. Like the Republic of Dave! Yeah? Whenever I started a new game, when I was still playing Fallout 3, because I did the same thing in Fallout 3 that I would do in any other Fallout game now, where I just keep making new characters over and over again, Mm -hmm. and then every single character just turns into a long-range shooter. Yeah? (laughs) Every single one. Well, the melee in those games really kind of sucked. Yeah. The, the, the gunplay was kind of janked still, but that's probably the best part. Like The melee and unarmed and everything in that game is not good. So Fallout 3, I would always make a beeline for the Republic of Dave because he has a really good rifle. <laughs> All right. Always make a beeline there and then just be like, hey, Dave, you're not president anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just overthrow Dave in one way or another. I got a 10 millimeter pistol. Hey, Dave, this is a coup. Looks like it's the Republic of Zack, the People's Democratic Republic of Zack. Ha ha! What was, oh man, what was like your least favorite quest in Fallout 3? Well, there are quite a lot of quests in that game. Not a huge amount compared to New Vegas, but there are a, a large amount of quests. <laughs> Significantly more than in Fallout 1, I'll say that. Mm-hmm. Um, least favorite quest? I mean, it'd probably be something I don't even remember because it's so forgettable. You've probably got one that sticks out to you, though, if you're mentioning Oh, it. I do. Is it uh, the quest to fight the giant ants? Gee, how did you know? How did you know that it's the quest to fight the giant ants? Where no matter where you are in the wasteland, as soon as you get past this one, or to this one point, as soon as you get to that one area, that stupid six-year-old kid comes running towards you. Help me, help me. Oh my God, it's giant ants. And you just can't avoid him. Yeah. <laughs> I started shooting at him. Yeah, but you can't kill kids in that game. No, sometimes if you shoot at him, he'll run away. That's true, but he comes back at you later then. Yeah, he comes back later. Oh my god, help me, the giant ants! And it's just like, oh my god, I don't want to deal with this right now. Did you ever sell him to slavery? You can do that? Of course you can. When you save him and and you find out his family is dead, and he goes, oh no, where do I go? If you've discovered Paradise Falls, hey, go to Paradise Falls, they'll take care of you. Oh my god, I didn't know that. (laughs) Oh, that's kind of messed up, but also funny. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of child slavery in that game. That one, that quest was very annoying for me. Also the quest uh, with the the vampires at Arafu. Ah, yes. It's pretty apparent that they want you to try to talk to them. Mm -hmm. It's a quest that you're not supposed to go running in guns blazing and just shoot everybody. Right. But also you got to talk to so many people. When I got to Tenpenny Tower, I... Because I'm so, I was so focused on I have to make the correct decision. Mm-hmm. And it, it's not a game where there's always a correct decision. When I got to Tenpenny Tower the first time, I was like, oh, well, I want, I want you know, these, these ghouls should be allowed in the tower. Mm-hmm. Why not? I know you're going with this. So I did all the stuff. I, I got them to let the ghouls in the tower. And then I came back a week later and everybody in the fucking tower was dead. <laughs> yeah. Except the ghouls. Mm-hmm. Like, what the hell happened? Oh, yeah, we killed everybody. Yep. Yeah, sure. Show them that we're just a bunch of we're a bunch of ghouls. <laughs> and I'm like, what the? F-? So I look it up. There's not a good ending to that quest. Not really. No. Basically, so I I went back and just murdered all the ghouls in the sewer. <laughs> and it was it was that was the point where I was kind of like, I don't know if I want to keep playing this game because a lot of people have complaints about that, but I'm of two minds with it. On one hand, I like that there's no best solution, and I do like how sometimes your actions have unintended consequences, but on the other hand, it is kind of a really dick move for the game to do that. Yeah. Pull the rug out from underneath you. A lot of people are kind of bitter about that, understandably so. How the choices you're making aren't presented up front. Yeah. And I, you can argue that either way. On one hand, you can be like, well, that's just how shit goes. <laughs> like, you can make all the right choices and shit still goes fucking pear-shaped. Yep. But on the other hand... It's, it's a good life lesson to learn, honestly. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's like... I'm playing I'm, I'm playing a... It's basically a wish fulfillment. And I really wanted them all to get along. I don't know. I. <laughs> you could argue either way of that. Anyway. It's certainly one of the more noteworthy quests. Was this the first Fallout game with uh, someone from a different country in it? Oh, you're talking about Moriarty? Yeah, Moriarty that's 
Irish? Irish. Yeah, he's got a bit of an Irish accent. For some reason. How did he get here? I don't know. It's kind of funny. I think that might be obligatory for Fallout games to just have a character that you ask, how did this person get here? Yeah, I wonder if that's a Like a the Australian thing. Kiwi lady in New Vegas. Yeah, apparently... I mean, I know we're going to talk about New Vegas later, but apparently that was a mistake. Oh, yeah. They wanted her to, to do it to... Like, it said in the notes that she was supposed to be more excited or something. <laughs> I, I forget what it was. Basically, it said, do a certain thing in the notes, and they, they misread it as use her native accent mm. so so bell just just did her native new zealander accent works for me for no reason I it's like just like they're, they're part of the they're part of the uh, the great cons exchange program <laughs> yeah fallout 3 has its problems though there's some pretty it's, stupid moments it's got some it's got some dumb parts you can't aim down iron sights which is shitty on speech checks in fallout 3 or just like any type of check isn't it the greater your stat is, the higher your chance of succeeding is. Yeah, so the higher your speech is, the better chance you have of succeeding. But if you fail a speech check, you can just reload. You can just reload and do that. Which, I'm going to be honest, I don't know which one I prefer more. I don't know if I prefer that or if I prefer the Fallout New Vegas of, if you don't meet it, you can't do it. Absolutely, in my mind, New Vegas. The speech system in Fallout 3 sucks. And they used basically the same speech system for four. Which also sucks. Yeah. In my mind, the best way to do speech out of all the ways we've seen would be New Vegas' system. But instead of telling you right off the bat if you're going to pass or fail the check before you select it, it keeps it ambiguous. So it doesn't say you have 98 out of the 99 for this speech. It just says, this is a speech check. Are you going to pass it? I don't know. You'll have to select it and find out. I think that would be a that would be a much better option. It's one of the options I have on right now for our New Vegas playthrough. I have those speech checks all turned off, but there is an option to turn them on but have the numbers hidden so it doesn't say if you're going to pass oh, or fail. Oh, that's a really good option. Yeah. It's yeah. The, probably the best way to do it. I'm going to change what I said. I think that would be that's the best way to do it is not tell you whether or not you're going to do it. That's a really good option. Cuz right now for our New Vegas playthrough uh, the character build that we have for you is that you have very low speech because everybody puts points into speech and using speech to pass all the checks is great and everything. But because you can see if a speech check is going to fail, nobody actively selects that option. Nobody chooses yeah. the option. And some of the speech failure lines can be quite hilarious. So what we have is we have the speech tag turned off. It doesn't tell you it's going to fail. It doesn't tell you it's going to be a, a failed speech check. So you actually get to select the option and see the fun stuff that comes yeah. from failing it. Are you a man of peace or of war? I like pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some there's some great speech checks in this game that people don't select. That's that's a low intelligence check. Oh, that's a low anyway, intelligence anyway, check. Anyway, yes. you, you know what I mean, yeah, though. Yeah. It's I, I'm sorry. I'm still I'm referring to anything where you have to meet a requirement as a speech check. Yeah, it's it's more of a skill check tech. Skill check. Yeah, sorry. That would be that's a much better way of putting it. Anyway, I don't particularly care for Fallout 3's way of doing the skill checks, because, yeah, I remember multiple times just saving and just spamming it until I got what I wanted. Yeah, anything that promotes save scumming is probably something we need to avoid. Yeah. It's got uh, Fallout 3, in my mind, has kind of that really gross piss filter that all the games from the early 2000s had. Basically, I mean, you can look at any game from the early 2000s. This, this precedes everything having the bloom filter. Yeah, bloom. Oh, my God. We may have overcorrected a bit much after that. Yeah. <laughs> Where everything is just blinding. It looks like it got smeared with grease, yeah. Yeah. Fallout 3, though, that was, for me, one of the first games that was like a branching narrative. A branching narrative, multiple options, gameplay. Yeah, a role-playing game. Yeah. Where you get to choose how things get resolved. Well, prior to that, when I thought of role-playing game, I thought of, like, Final, Final Fantasy, Fantasy. Yeah. Which is not a role-playing game. I would disagree with you on that. It's a role-playing game in that you're playing... As a specific character. No, I will I will defend that a little bit here. I'm going to take a little time to defend that. Uh, some of the, the Final Fantasy games are absolutely linear, and the choices you make don't have any real consequences. You're just playing through a linear story. But Final Fantasy VI does have some branches to it. You can beat the game without finding any of the characters. Okay, but my, what, I, what I'm trying to argue is that Final Fantasy even VI, which I will admit is probably the best one. Probably is still not a role-playing game because you are playing this character. You're not playing someone that you made. You're not playing a specific... You are playing a role, yes, but it is a role of 
John, the protagonist. I see what you're saying. So a character creation system is pretty important for in, you. In my mind, a character creation system is what makes a role-playing game a role-playing game. Okay. Because otherwise, you're just playing as John, the protagonist. <laughs> yeah, you're still playing a role, but it's not a unique role. It's not a unique role. I, I guess... I don't know. I, maybe at some point, my at some point for me, the wires got crossed, and a role playing game is supposed to be you are playing a protagonist that you created. Mm -hmm. You are not playing what the direct the character the director wanted you to play. Okay, there are some lines that can be blurred there. One of my favorite games, The Walking Dead, has you playing as a set character, but you can play him in a, a variety of ways. You can play him as the nice guy, the uh, sympathetic guy, or you can play him as the cold hearted practical guy he is yeah. or you can play him as a silent protagonist and not pick any of the dialogue options and just let him fail every dialogue option i mean i guess i guess that's still a real i don't know maybe maybe at this point i'm arguing semantics of what it, what does and what doesn't constitute a role-playing game possibly I, that is entirely possible that i'm just arguing the semantics of this constitutes a role-playing game this doesn't and maybe that's entirely my personal belief structure around what constitutes a, an rpg and what doesn't because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're basically just using you're using different terms to define what a game is. Right. Because it makes it easier than saying, it's a game where you do this, 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 this. It's easier to go, it's an RPG, and then everybody understands what you mean. To summarize it very quickly is, it, it was one of the first games I played that gave me the freedom to play a character that you designed and that you want to play. Right, and put points into the specific stats you want them to be defined by. Yes. And do the things and make the moral choices you want them to make. Yes. Looking back, I see a lot of flaws in Fallout 3's design, but I can also overlook them because it was the first Fallout game in the 3D series. Mm -hmm. Like The transition had some growing pains. They lost some of the role-playing elements. I can forgive it for that. I can forgive they have this big, dumb crater that they live in, which honestly should probably flood on a regular basis because it's just a hole in the ground. And they have, they're worshipping a giant bomb because they're all stupid. Like, I can forgive some of the well, dumb narrative stuff. Well, some of them are worshipping the giant bomb. And the rest of them are just okay with it. The rest of them are just okay that they live right next to it. Which, I mean, it, it makes sense that they built right outside of the vault. But why would you build it right next to a nuclear weapon? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they talk about how they took the material for this town from an airport so many, so many miles away. And you'd think, why don't you just live in the airport? Oh, I didn't know they talked about that. That makes sense that the front door is built out of like a jet engine then. I never thought about that. I guess I had I didn't never, think about that either until you just mentioned that, yeah. I, I had never I had never talked to someone that talked about them building it out of an airport. Apparently one of the one or two of the NPCs talk about it, yeah. Huh. I didn't know that. Um still learning stuff about that game that I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, there are definitely some problems with it. That doesn't make the game bad. A lot of people look fondly on Fallout 3 and it captures the atmosphere the best in a lot of people's eyes. So no one could say it's the, the worst in the series, but it doesn't necessarily offer the things that I value the most out of the Fallout series. I think it's kind of weird that you can switch between first person and third person. They wanted to keep third person in there for people that were diehard fans of Fallout 1 and 2. I feel like that's the only reason they kept third person in there so that people would be like, oh, I remember this from Fallout 1 and 2. Okay, third person. Now I can play this game. But I feel like they should have just done a solid transition to first person. Honestly, for me, I enjoyed the third person because up to that point, I had played a lot of platformer games and games where you're watching your character move around in third person, and I was terrible at first person games. And eventually I grew into Fallout's first person system, but it was only after a transition period where I was playing from it in a third person point of view. Yeah. Much like how VATS helps people that aren't good at shooters, the third person system helped me who wasn't good at first person perspectives. Right. Right. There's parts of the story that I don't particularly care for. I hate how linear it is and how stupid it can be sometimes. It is relatively linear. Fallout 3, in my mind, suffers from the exact same problem that Fallout 4 suffers from. Oh, we're not talking about Fallout 4 yet, but please, go on. Which, the problem that those two games suffer from is they had a very clear story that they wanted to tell, and you must do that story. Oh, yes. The, uh, there's only one real ending to Fallout 3. <laughs> there was slight variations. Either you sacrifice yourself or you don't, and you contaminate the water or you don't. And that's really it. And, I, I and there's no ending slideshow for Fallout 3 either. I thought there was. No, you, you, you think so in your mind, but if you actually go back and play, there's nothing that tells you about how Megaton blossomed or perished depending on your actions at the end of the game. Oh yeah, it's basically just you finished the game. You finished the game... 
and that's it. Yeah, they don't tell you about what Tenpenny did. They don't tell you about anything. No, they just say you were a good person because you saved the world, or you were a bad person because you didn't save the world, and someone else had to do it for you. The end. It's a very lackluster ending, and then they, they kind of tried to improve it by adding... Well, that's the DLC. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. I, it really bothers me that the ending of Fallout 3 is basically... You have... A, you could send somebody else to do that, but no. No. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that. You have a super mutant with you. Just send him in there. He's immune to radiation. No. 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 This is your journey. It's especially notable because prior to that, you, you were at one point in a vault with a lot of radiation... Uh-huh. And the super mutant said, don't go into the radioactive room. If there's something that needs to be done in there, send me. I'll go do it. And he goes, he goes and does the thing in the radioactive room. And then at the end of the game, that exact same scenario plays out. And he just refuses to do it. And you have to go kill yourself this in the radioactive room. This is your room. story. Yeah. I don't want this to turn into a bitch about Fallout 3 session. We can. We're talking about Fallout 3. All of its warts and everything. Don't get me wrong. I love Fallout 3. I don't think it's... Out of all the Fallout games, it's not my favorite. But I love Fallout 3. It's also not our least favorite. It's definitely not my least favorite. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. It's a it's a great game, but yeah, it has it has some problems. It has some growing pains. Even if Fallout 3 does pigeonhole you into like one ending and having to go find your dad, who's voiced by Liam Neeson, which is pretty great. I thought that was cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Liam Neeson's my dad? <laughs> yeah. Yay! Even if it does pigeonhole you into an ending, you still you still do get a lot of freedom in choosing how to play your specific character. In some ways, there are a couple of skill checks, but looking back on it, there's not nearly enough role playing to, compared to what there is in modern games or what there could be. It's easy right now for me to look back and criticize it for its design, mm-hmm. but at the time, it did give me more freedom than I even knew what to do with, and I actually couldn't play the game for a while until I got accustomed to it yeah but there are there's still a lot more restriction to it in terms of character building your character has to be from the vault and then you have to join the brotherhood you have to work with the brotherhood you can't ever side with the enclave you can't do any faction choosing of your choice yeah, there's not really any other factions to it's pick a, it's an in incredibly linear story and there's only one ending basically not enough role playing for my tastes these days, but for what it was at the time, I enjoyed it. I feel like it's been so long since I played it, I don't know if I really can have a valid opinion on it. I played a lot of it, though. I broke one of my discs of that game because I played so much of it. Ah, <laughs> nice. I've only done that with two games in my entire life, and it was Fallout 3. I, I broke the disc for it on pl- on uh, Xbox 360. Because and you played through it so much. Because I played it so much. There were multiple times where I would legitimately just leave the game on mm-hmm. and go to sleep. Mm. So it's just on and running. <laughs> um, and it, it like broke the disc. And I did that with Modern Warfare 2. I broke the disc for that game too. Mm. Because I played it so much. Nice. Um, anyway. I guess that's a mark of a good game. Zach played Fallout 3 so hard he broke it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that was in that game that I thought was really cool. I really enjoyed it. I beat it many, many times. I played through it a few years ago with a survival mod on, which added another layer to it. It, it. It's not a bad game if you try it with a proper survival mod on. It adds a little bit more fun to it. I don't like survival mods. Eh, it's not for everyone. I, I really don't like playing survival games. This whole modern trend of crafting survival... Well, it used to be a lot bigger, but the this like modern trend of crafting survival games, I, I hate them. Mm-hmm. I, I can't play them. I just get so frustrated because we're not talking about crafting survival games, but the problem I have with crafting survival games is if they're single player, you get to a point where you have legitimately everything and then there's no reason to do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Because you started the game banging two rocks together and now you have a fucking AK-47 and a full play carrier and you got an M1 Abrams parked in the backyard. Well, in Fallout 3, it was a lot more difficult because there was no crafting in that game. There's like some very, very basic weapon oh, crafting. Oh, yeah. But There's what? We- okay. Fallout 3 has no water purification crafting. You can't purify water very easily. I think in the mod that I had, you could find tablets that made it more drinkable, but those were scarce. Like, it was actually a survival game mm-hmm. in the typical sense of you actually had to scavenge for things. And it made you really want to find things that you could scavenge. So it made that game a lot more enjoyable. Fallout 3 worked pretty good as a fun scavenging game. But 
it's not that great of a role playing game. The karma system is really restrictive. I'm glad that Fallout New Vegas mostly yeah. did away with that. Yeah, Fallout the karma, karma system, system is kind of yeah, it's pretty bad. It's stupid because it's like you can be a perfectly good, you can be perfectly good, the the most perfect boy, having never done anything wrong, and then accidentally steal something, and now everyone hates you. Because you, because that, nobody even saw you steal it. That's not even a problem with the karma system. That's just the the stealing mechanic being kind of broken. Ugh, it's ridiculous. But the karma system, like you couldn't recruit companions unless you had neutral karma. You had hit squads coming after you if you were too good or too evil. Oh my god, I forgot about the Talon Company mercenaries that come after you if you're too good. Yes, which makes... It's like, who is who is sending you after me? Again, lots of things in the game make no sense if you stop and think about it. Why did this town build their city around a bomb in a crater, sh schlepping all this material from an airport so many miles away? Why is this one guy living in a fancy tower that's somehow still structurally sound, living the life of luxury even though he has no supply line? Why is this like this? Why is this like this? None of this makes any sense if you stop thinking about it for five seconds. Because well, he's got Burke. Yeah, Burke is so resourceful. Yeah, Burke just finds everything. Burke is a one-man army. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the stuff in that game doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the vampires, they, the, the, the vampires that are living in here, you settle an agreement with them between them and the people of Arafu. All two people that are still living in Arafu. Yeah, no one's living in Arafu anymore. Two there's, people. there's the one guy that's super grumpy, that's the, like the town guard, and I think one other lady. Who's got dementia and her, her husband. Yeah. Yeah. There's nobody living in Arafu. How are they going to get whatever? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, Fallout 3 has a couple of, quote, towns like that. Towns that have four people living in them. I, you kind of just have to pretend that there's... I mean, it's it's a very similar thing to in Fallout New Vegas when you go into Freeside. They have the audio playing. Like, there's like there's hundreds of people talking. Oh, uh, yeah. And there's just nobody around. Uh, I feel like that's more of a limitation on, like, the engine, but still. I guess, but yeah, you know. I mean, we're talking about stupid things in Fallout 3. We didn't even mention the little lamplight. How have they not all been killed? Yeah, oh, this this little settlement of children was started when uh, a school trip, a school field trip went wrong and all the kids got stranded and they had, to be, they had to form a society by themselves. And here they are like 200 years later. 200 years later. The thing that makes no sense to me about Little Lamplight, everyone leaves when they're 18. Mm -hmm. Where are more kids coming from? I realize, I, I'm not going to get into it, but I realize that people under the age of 18 can have children. <laughs> I'm assuming they just kidnap other children. Do they just go out into the way? Do they send hunting parties out in the wasteland to grab children and bring them back there? They have to, unless you want to try and imagine a 14-year-old they... girl. I... Yeah, <laughs> no, right? Not going to imagine that. Yeah. Uh, they have to be doing that because otherwise there were not enough kids on that field trip to create a stable gene pool. <laughs> That's, a, again, a problem with the vaults as well, yeah. <laughs> I remember the first time I went to Little Lamplight and they were like, yeah, a bunch of kids, a bunch of kids got stuck here on a field trip. And I was like, who the fuck's having a field trip in the post-apocalypse? <laughs> and it, it didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind. It didn't even cross my mind that it was like 200 years worth ago. Thing, yeah. Yeah. Little Lamplight makes no sense whatsoever. No. It doesn't matter how you think about it. So many things in that game make no sense if you stop and think about it for five minutes. Which, at the time, none of us did. It was just a fun game to explore. Yeah, I think that's... Maybe that's just the problem is we've gotten older and we're just fucking jaded now. <laughs> we're looking at things with a more analytical eye and we can see when things don't make any damn sense. You think Zoomers are gonna, in the future look back and be like, yeah, why the fuck were all these people on this space station and one of them was among us? <laughs> Someone's doing a, a video essay three hours long about the plot of Among Us. About the plot, <laughs> yeah. I don't... Yeah, like the karma system, how that's just stupid. The karma system is busted. The speech system is busted. There aren't really any other skill checks in that game. Yeah, not really. The role playing is very limited. At times, it's stupidly binary, like blow up the town or don't blow up the town. Yeah. What DLC would you like to talk about first? We'll talk about Broken Steel because Broken Steel is basically the ending that they wanted to do for the game, but they didn't for some fucking reason. Yeah, the epilogue chapter. Yeah, it's the ending that adds it so that what's his name goes, oh yeah, you're right, I probably should go in there, huh? Yeah, it's the one that makes your companions intelligent enough to realize, oh yes, I will go into that radioactive room because I'm immune to radiation. So you, they do that, and then you get to survive and see the end game. Yeah. I don't, I guess I don't really have a lot of complaints about it. It's just kind of more of the same. 
It is, but at the same time, there are some good points. I uh, went back and played that a few years ago. I played that DLC, and there were some fun moments, uh, some good things. It was fun to see how your actions actually did start to shape the world. Yeah. You saw how some people were trying to take advantage of the clear water to sell a cure-all. And, you know, something like that is nice, considering that Fallout 3 didn't even have, like I said before, didn't even have an ending slideshow. You couldn't see how your actions had affected the world. So yeah. actually seeing your effects was nice. It's nice that something actually changed in that world, depending on the choices you've made. I, I liked it. I thought it was I thought it was good for what it was. It was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Any complaints I have about it are the same complaints I have about Fallout 3. So Yeah, it's linear, it's no kind point. of streamlined, yeah. 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 I, mean, I, get, I don't need to add anything to that. Uh Mothership Zeta. Mothership Zeta was a fun little linear adventure, I thought. It's a fun little romp, but like god, I get so fucking sick of walking around in that stupid spaceship. <laughs> That's a fair thing. That's a fair complaint to have against it. I have the same complaint about that spaceship that I do about all the vaults in Fallout. They all look the same. Mm -hmm. Every single corridor looks the same. And I, I don't typically play Fallout for a linear experience. I like a more open role-playing kind of thing where I can go places and see things. And can't really do that as much in Mothership Beta because, again, it's very linear. Yeah. You're going along a scripted pathway for the most part. You have a, a final spectacular spaceship battle thing, and then it's done. But there are some nice branches. I found out you could kill the first lady that you meet, the one who's supposed to help you through the entire game. Like the oh, one. yeah, you can. Yeah, so the person who's supposed to be helping you, you can just, you just offer, you can kill her right there in the beginning. So uh, there are some variants to make, but there's no there's no role-playing choices. There's no point where you can change the story in any way. Yeah, not really. There are some civilian aliens you could execute or choose not to, but that's really it. No role-playing, really. Oh, the pit. I remember the pit being pretty good. It's okay. Again, linear story. You're shoehorned into basically making two choices. And the problem I have with the pit is either side is stupid. The plot of it's pretty stupid, but for what it is, it's a fun little adventure. Going around collecting steel ingots can be kind of fun. Hunting those things down. I'm mad you can't eat the baby. There is a mod you can install which allows you to eat a baby. Eat the baby. Eat the baby. Eat the baby. <laughs> If you got that cannibal perk, you can eat the cure, yes. Yeah. I don't know. I think the pit is interesting, but it's not great. It's a fun little bit of gameplay, but yeah. yeah. Once you've done it once, there's not much more to... Not really a reason to go back. I don't like it when you're already like a decent way into the story, and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, we're taking away all your shit. I have a different opinion about that. I believe that it's actually quite fun. I like it when I go to uh, like uh, New Vegas's. Old World Blues DLC where you can... I, I just put all my stuff in a box and I just don't use it for a while. And I actually have to start over and start scavenging things. And then maybe halfway through you get your, some of your stuff back. But I like having to scavenge and make use of the resources given to me. I kind of find it frustrating that in things like Mothership Zeta, they just give you your gear right off the bat when you have all this cool alien technology you could experiment with. Yeah, fair enough. Point look out. The best of Fallout 3's DLCs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a, it's like a big open area for you to explore. It's a giant swampy area with ruins and a, there's a old abandoned concentration camp. Little settlements here, a Ferris wheel amusement park, a ghoul living on a cliff, a, a fight den. There's a, a lot of fun stuff to find. I know there's one specific area you can go to where if you hide out there, because the locals are like all horribly mutated swamp people. Yeah. If you go there... And you basically wait until midnight. A bunch of swamp people show up and start having a hoedown. Yeah, start dancing. Like, do, 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 do. It's, it's it's hilarious. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot of really fun stuff in that. I had, I, unfortunately, I can't remember too much of it because it's been so long since I played it. But I remember really liking Point Lookout. Not much more to say about it, really, though. Well, now on to. Doesn't Fallout Three have five DLCs though? Are we forgetting about... Oh, we are! What one are we forgetting? We're missing the best one! What one? How could we have overlooked Operation Anchorage? Oh, God! Did I... No! That... Oh, man, that sucks! <laughs> the only reason... The only... The only reason to do Operation Anchorage is you do it right at the start of the game, 
so that you get power armor training and the Chinese stealth armor. That's it. That's the only reason to play that. Yes. That DLC sucks. You play a role-playing game and then you go into a simulation and play as somebody else in your role-playing game. You play a first-person shooter in a game where you can't aim down iron sights. <laughs> you play a Call of Duty campaign and you can't aim down, or you can't ADS. Yep. It there, sucks. There are a couple of skill checks, if I recall, but yeah, it's a very linear shooter and it doesn't feel anything like a fall but, experience. Yeah, like the skill checks are you can maybe get more stuff from the quartermaster and you can tell you can commit the Chinese or make the Chinese general fucking commit suicide. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Largely, yeah. It's not a very lengthy DLC, but it's not horrible one time, but I never want to go back. Yeah. If you've done it once, it's just like, wow, that was enough. And the worst part is it's it really isn't that long. But it feels like it goes on forever. Mm -hmm. It just sucks. All the fun stuff about Fallout 3 isn't there. You can't loot dead bodies because they just disappear. Yep. Everything just goes pew. It you just... can't add anything to your inventory, really. You just grab health items that are lying around. Yeah, it, it sucks. It's not fun. It's an interesting experience, but not what I want from a Fallout. Yeah. I can't believe we forgot about it, though. Wow, how could we? <laughs> Now on to the best Fallout game. Fallout 4. Yes, Fallout 4. Oh, wait, we skipped over New Vegas. Oh, that's right. Uh, I, I think it's probably fair to say that we like Fallout New Vegas better than any other Fallout game. Yeah, we've uh, played a lot of it. I, I think Fallout New Vegas is probably perfect. There's like a couple little things like what you mentioned about the... What you mentioned about like the speech checks. Yeah, I would change that. It's buggy as fuck. Yeah, I'd change that. Well, we say it's buggy as fuck, but we've been playing the same save file on it for five years compared to Fallout 4, which has just gone completely jank on us oh, after a year. Oh, that's true, yeah. Fallout New Vegas is surprisingly incredibly stable at this point. Uh, yeah, that's... You, you're right. Fallout New Vegas is the best Fallout game, in, in my opinion. Yes. By far. I don't think that's a controversial opinion at all. No. Most people seem to like Fallout New Vegas, and it's not even... It technically isn't finished. Yeah, it was rushed development. It had to be completed in like 18 months. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot. There's so much good stuff in Fallout New Vegas. There's a bunch of really cool companions. And companions aren't like Fallout 3. These, these ones, you generally have quests and in-depth character development. Yep. It doesn't matter what kind of character you're playing. You probably can hire any one of the companions unless you do something like real fucked up. Like blow up the Brotherhood of Steel, Veronica might not be too happy about yeah, that. Yeah, or if you go directly to the Legion camp with Arcade Ganon with you, <laughs> he might not be too pleased. No. They've got their own personalities and preferences. Mm -hmm. None of the quests are really all that mandatory. There's very little linearity to it. You can join many different factions, four variable different factions, mm -hmm. and you can do quests for them and resolve their quests in a multitude of ways. Three factions, one of them is Yes Man. Who counts as a faction. And if you look beyond that, there's also more endings than just those four. You can have a Legion ending with Kaisar. You can have a Legion ending with Lanius. You can have an NCR ending with or without the Brotherhood. You can have Yes Man being backed by five tribes or none of the tribes. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of different endings for that game. There's lots of different choices you can make. You don't have a specific backstory. You are just a career and your backstory is whatever you want it to be. That is one of the things that I think I like most about this game is that you play the game as a character that you come up with. You don't play the game as I'm looking for my dad or where's Sean? You play the game as I'm the motherfucking mailman. Your backstory is whatever you want it to be. You, you, maybe you were born in a vault. Maybe you weren't. Maybe it's uh, whatever you want it to be. Yep. Large amount of freedom with that game, which I definitely enjoy. So any criticisms we have would probably be nitpicky. What nitpicky criticisms do you have about New Vegas? It's kind of ugly. It hasn't aged all that well. It's very but, brown. I mean, that's, that's a, yeah, it's very brown. It's kind of ugly, but that's partially just because of how old the game is. The Legion doesn't really have a lot to do. There's, there's definitely way more stuff to do if you side with Mr. House or the NCR. Mm -hmm. The Legion kind of doesn't have a whole lot of quests. There are a lot of NCR line quests, and some of them do have uh, Legion counter quests, but not all of them. Yeah. Um, I wish that, they, I kind of wish they would have done more with the Legion. I wish there would have been more options for stuff you could do with the Legion. So when I made my mod for Fallout New Vegas, I did try to add some counter quests. Like when you go to Prim 
and you have to deal with the powder gangers. I added a quest where you could side with the powder gangers. Mm -hmm. And there's the quest where you free the captured powder gangers from the legionary. So I added a quest where you kill the powder gangers for the legionary, just so there'd be more of a counter quest there. I like having multiple options, but there are a couple of quests where there's basically only one real option. Yeah. So that's a small nitpick I have. I also think speech is a little overpowered and charisma is definitely garbage. Yeah, charisma means absolutely nothing in that game and speech can be can be pretty overpowered. I don't remember what mod it was you were playing. This was before we'd even started the channel. And you were talking about one of the mods you were playing where you got to a boss and he like knocks you unconscious and you wake up and he's like, oh, you think you're going to use your high speech to talk me down, huh? <laughs> Tough nuts. I put a ball gag in your mouth. And your only <laughs> options were to go. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so like you couldn't actually use your speech check. Yeah. <laughs> which I think was a hilarious way to get around that. Yeah. I actually have a mod on right now I'm experimenting with where speech is kind of tied to charisma. Where if you haven't put enough points into charisma, then your speech can't go very high. Like if, hmm. you, if you only got five charisma then your speech can't be higher than 75. That's interesting. So if you want to put points into speech, you also have to invest points into charisma. You have to yeah. invest perk upgrades into charisma, go for the strength training and charisma. So it's still a pretty powerful ability to have to speech talk your way through everything, but you also have to give up other skills here and there, which mm -hmm. I think would be a decent way to balance things out. I could go into greater detail about that some other time, but... Yeah, charisma is really terrible. If you're role playing as a charismatic character, there's no, there's absolutely no reason to put points into charisma because it doesn't make you more charismatic. Yeah, it doesn't really open more opportunities. Just gets you better prices at stores. And I think that's actually tied to barter, not charisma. Oh God, you're right. I think charisma does literally only a few things. You can talk to a couple of children and give them gum. You can flirt with the traumatized victim at the. Cam McCarran, you get a couple more points into your barter and speech, but you can just put points into manually anyway. Yeah. It's not even tied to like the flirtatious options. You can get Lady Killer and Black Widow without having any points in charisma. As long as your points in speech are high enough, it's all that matters. Yeah. Charisma basically affects nothing. Your reputation doesn't go up faster if you've got high charisma. Like, nothing happens if you've got charisma. Yeah. I don't like the weapon condition feature in Fallout New Vegas. Which I realize is also in 3. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of it, but I don't know of another way that you could implement it and still have it make sense. I think it's not that bad. It's not that bad, honestly. Especially if you're a character, like, if you're playing a character kind of like how I play the game, where you just have really high repair scale. <laughs> yeah. Where you just, you can just slap, a, you can take a bolt action rifle and somehow the parts just work in your, in your, in your AR yeah. that you have. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, I'm just let me just rip apart this minigun and use it use it to fix my AR-15. That it's a wish film. It doesn't need to make sense. Yeah. So I don't necessarily care for the for the weapon condition. I think that's a little dumb, but I don't know how I would change it. I, I really have no idea how I would change it because like we'll make it so that the, the weapon condition lasts longer. Yeah, but then it doesn't really matter. Would you want weapon conditions stripped out entirely, like they have in Fallout 4? I don't know, because I, I, I think that's a really interesting concept. Anytime, anytime in games where they try to have like a weapon jamming thing, it's never, it never works how they want it to. It always just becomes a massive annoyance. So perhaps keep weapon degradation in, but it doesn't make your weapon jam. It just makes it do slightly less damage up to a point. Well, yeah, but then it's like, why Why on earth would it make my gun do less damage? It's not like the bullets are going slower. Well, the other option would be to have your weapon jam, which you hate. Yeah. I don't know. It, it bothers me, but it, it doesn't bother me enough to be like, yeah, just remove it from the game. I can understand the weapon degradation affecting melee weapons where they do less damage. Because especially for, like, bladed melee weapons. They start going dull, so it's going to do less damage. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've actually used a weapon to the point where it broke in that game. I've never used a weapon so much that it was in such frail condition and I couldn't repair it. Like, it, it, even if a weapon has weapon degradation, you can fire a lot out of it or use it for a lot without it breaking on you. I guess if I was going to change weapon degradation, what I would probably do is not do it where 
you have to use parts from another gun to fix it. Or if you have to use parts from another gun to fix this specific weapon, then that is a weapon that is basically destroyed. I, I feel like weapon degradation should have been handled where you could have had a clean... Like in The Long Dark, where you have a weapon cleaning kit. Oh, okay. And you have to clean the weapon periodically. Hmm. So the weapon condition will start going down. And once it gets to a certain point, you have to clean it. <laughs> and that uses up a portion of your weapon cleaning so kit. So maybe, maybe it has... Yeah, and that uses up like your weapon cleaning kit. And then maybe have like... You have two weapon degradation bars. Mm -hmm. One of them is your weapon's overall condition, and the other one is your weapon's cleanliness. Okay. So your weapon's overall condition is something that you maybe necessarily can't do anything about. So you wish Fallout New Vegas had weapon repair kits? Well, it has weapon repair <laughs> kits. <laughs> it but does. I, what I'm wishing is what I wish is that it had a weapon cleaning kit, mm -hmm. and then your overall weapon condition is something that maybe you can't necessarily fix unless you have a high enough repair skill. Okay. I kind of wish they had done something like that. I also don't like the armor condition. Armor Ar armor condition, I think, is annoying. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. I've, I've had my armor break on me more often than I've had my weapon break on me, and it's just kind of weird to be standing out there, and then suddenly I'm naked. Yeah, I don't I don't like armor condition, and I guess I understand, like, if you have, ar if you have armor that's supposed to stop bullets, I understand in real life that you can't just put an armor plate in there and just have it absorb bullets forever. Yeah. Most yeah. armor plate is going to break after several gunshots. You have to balance between that being a video game and whatnot. Yeah. See, obviously there's balancing things that have to, that come into play that need to be done, but I, I wish that armor didn't break. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of annoying. That's fair. Yeah. Especially when it's like light armor. If you're building like a light armor character and now your armor is broken, you can't take that armor off. Especially if it's like a rare armor that there's only one of. You can't take that armor off because if you take it off, you will never be able to put it back on. Oh yeah, because you have to find someone to repair it before you can put it back on. Yep. Or you have to have a high enough repair skill to smash two armors together. <laughs> yeah. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for armor. So I don't know. I I'm not a big fan of the the armor repair. If I'm if I'm picking little nitpicky things about Fallout New Vegas, I don't like. I don't particularly care for that. I don't like the trusty Vault 13 canteen. Yeah, I just dropped that immediately. That drives me nuts. I hate how when you load up the game and you have this amazing view of the world that you're finally being allowed to explore, and then you have to endure a full minute of pop-ups letting you know the DLC is installed. Yeah, that's that's annoying. When Fallout New Vegas first came out. That was during the height of the pre-order frenzy. Yes. Where you could order from Best Buy or Amazon or GameStop and whichever one you went through had a different pack. Well, you couldn't order from Amazon yet. Well, you probably could, but it didn't have pre-order bonuses yet. You know what I'm talking about. But though. yeah, yeah. Whichever store you went through, Walmart, whatever, you'd get a special pack. You'd just get some free stuff up front. Yes. And then in the Game of the Year edition, you just got all of those things up front and it breaks the balance of the game up front because you suddenly have a grenade launcher and you're at level one. At the beginning one. of the game. You've yeah. got upgraded armor, which which double your damage threshold. It's just, it's incredibly overpowered. Mm -hmm. So that, I hate how that unbalances the game. You kind of have to force yourself to not use it. Yeah. Which I, there's been multiple times that I've played Fallout New Vegas and I don't have the self-control to not use that shit. That's, it's so I play, powerful. I play the game and it's like the very beginning of the game, I have a fucking grenade launcher. Yeah, I'm going to use that grenade launcher. Yeah. So I actually do have a mod on it, which not only delays the DLC announcements, but also takes all the stuff that would be given to you if you have the collector's edition yeah. and spreads it throughout the game. Like the uh, improved armor you get, which would normally be front loaded and given to you right off the bat. It says, yeah, you got this pack installed. Here's some free armor. Yeah, the mercenary pack or whatever. Yeah, that actually, yeah, the updated Vault 13 slightly better armor is actually hidden in Doc Mitchell's house. Which makes sense because he and his wife both live in the vault, so it makes sense uh, he'd have yeah. two. Yeah, yep. Like that was a great design choice for that mod. Mm -hmm. It definitely fixed the problems that came with that DLC pack. I don't like how Gunrunners adds a different version of each gun that can be modded differently. So now you've got two different versions. Oh yeah, so you you've got like the the marksman rifle or the the marksman carbine. But then you have the Gunrunner's Marksman Carbine, which uses different things. Yeah, you can put mods on the Gunrunner's Carbine, but not on the other Carbine. Yeah. That's annoying. I thought the weapon modding was kind of neat, but really pointless. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't really find the weapon mods you wanted most of the time. I like how Fallout 4 improved the crafting system, because Fallout New Vegas' crafting system was kind of rudimentary. 
Fallout, yeah, Fallout New Vegas' crafting system, that was going to be one of my other complaints, is I don't like Fallout New Vegas' crafting system. It's I never use it. No. I, do, I can't speak for everybody else, but I legitimately never use it. I never go survival, and I never, like, built stuff. Like, if you go survival and you want to make your own healing potions, where are you going to find the Xander root and the Brock flowers? Like, there's, like, three or four locations in the world where they are. Yeah, they're just kind of, like, randomly strewn about the wasteland. Yeah. Um... Like, occasionally, I use the weapon workbenches to make more ammo, but it's like, whenever I think, oh, I should make more ammo, I never have the right shell casings. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, you don't have enough, you don't have enough rifle powder. Okay, well, what do I need to make rifle powder? Well, you gotta break down all these other shell casings for ammo that you have and need. Okay, well, here's the thing that I'm gonna push back on you against that for. I think... If you're gonna have a game that has so many different calibers, like New Vegas does, mm -hmm. I've whinged about it a few times like there's a lot of different calibers in new vegas so if you want to break down specific calibers and turn them into calibers for weapons that you have i think that's a great option considering that i i agree with you on that but i kind of feel like in fall at new vegas they should have just had gunpowder and primers it shouldn't have been large pistol primers small pistol primers large rifle primers small rifle primers yeah, that's fair yeah it should have just been one for e pistol primers rifle primers shotgun primers there Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I feel like it should just should have been that, and then it should have just been gunpowder for everything. And I realize I am a gun nerd, <laughs> yeah, and that there is a big fucking difference between pistol powder and rifle powder because they burn at two different rates. But you don't need to put that in a video game. Well, uh, you say that, but there are people that say it's better because of it. Would you say the same thing is true about having generic shell ammo in Fallout Four? How they just combined all the different calibers of shotgun shell and just made them shell ammo so now there's no difference between a 12 gauge and a 20 gauge is that an improvement too i think for gameplay yeah yeah maybe maybe if i i don't know maybe that's should we do the same thing for other calibers should we get rid of 45 and 556 and just have nine mil go into everything no this is, you know you're talking about real life which is incredibly complicated and it's not made by a by a selected design team i'm sorry our, our 12 and 20 gauge weapons not real life either you're are you trying to argue that because i said that for gameplay reasons that we should only have one type of gunpowder that therefore we should only have one type of gunpowder in real life i'm saying that you wanted a simplification of the weapon crafting and not having not needing specific yeah, in a primers. video game well let's extend that you said that the shell thing is a good change too how they come get rid of all the different calibers for shotgun should we also simplify handgun ammo and just have like we've got nine mil, no. we've got forty five, and we got five five six, and everything else uses those three calibers? No. That would be simplification too. That would be simplification. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. We will do that. You are in charge of that. Good luck with getting the entire rest of the world. <laughs> Good luck with getting the rest of the world to follow suit on that. We're not talking about real life. We're talking about the video game. We've co already combined twenty gauge and twelve gauge into shell ammo, generic shell ammo. That's what Fallout 4 does. That's what I'm talking about. Fallout 4 has just combined 12 and 20 gauge ammo yeah. into generic shell ammo. Should we do the same with all these other handgun ammos and assault rifle ammos? That's what they did in Fallout 4. No, Fallout 4 has 9mm ammo and 45 ammo and all this stuff. Should we just have generic, quote, handgun ammo and then, quote, assault rifle ammo? And a Beretta uses the same ammo as a Desert Eagle or something. I don't know. It depends on what kind of game you're trying to do. Would you be annoyed if in Fallout 5, all handgun ammo was combined into generic handgun ammo? I guess, no, not really. Really? I, if I really, if it really bothers me that much, then I will, because I, when, we, when we were recording Fallout 4, and I find a gun and it's in the wrong caliber, the only reason I remark on it is because I know that it's not in the right caliber. Mm -hmm. And because that's just what I do is remark on stuff. I have to be a pedantic asshole. <laughs> but it's not like if Fallout 5 comes out and everything is just handgun caliber. Mm -hmm. Everything is just pistol bullets. And it doesn't tell you if it's 9mm or 45 cal. It, it just doesn't says, tell what it is. Yeah. It's just pistol bullets. And I'm using a Mauser broom handle, but I'm also using like an FN 5.7 for some reason. Then I'm gonna be like, yeah, uh, uh, actually, those are two different calibers, and it depends on which version of the mouse I'm room handling it. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna say something about it, but when I'm playing the game, I don't really care. Okay. I'm just gonna use it. All right. I think it's, I think it's convenient. All right. And that would do away with the annoying ammo recrafting 
breaking it down and adding and changing the caliber. Yeah. See, I think it's really nice playing Fallout New Vegas and being like, I need more hunting rifle ammo. Let me break down five millimeter ammo because I don't ever use that. Except the problem is they're different primers, they're different shell casings, and they're different things. So gameplay balancing, it's like, why am I even breaking down this ammo? Yeah, it's just easier to trade it for the ammo you need. Yeah. The point I was trying to argue is that I, I think the crafting system is not great in Fallout New Vegas. Mm-hmm. Uh, what recipes have you ever even used in New Vegas? They've got a lot of them. Gecko steak. I think we make some kind of steak sometimes, but even the food doesn't give you the bonuses they do in the subsequent games. Yeah. But uh, you can get some healing items from them. You can make stim packs and healing powders. You make a doctor's bag, I think, if you have the right stuff. If, if you've scavenged random garbage, which you normally don't even keep an eye out for that yeah, stuff. Yeah, because, you know, there's not there's not really a reason to craft stuff in not, that game. Yeah, not really. Like, the only reason I can see to craft doctor's bags is to use those, but it's just like, whenever I take damage in Fallout New Vegas, I just spam stim packs. Or go to bed and heal for an hour. Yeah, or sleep for an hour, and suddenly you're healed. Right. I guess it might be more important for somebody doing a hardcore run where that doesn't fix that. Yeah. But the hardcore mode, oh, speaking of nitpicky, Fallout New Vegas' hardcore mode is just a mild and nuisance mode. Oh, is it? I never play it. Well, Fallout New Vegas, you have to keep on drinking and eating, but there's food and water everywhere. This is not a game like Fallout 3 where water is difficult to come by. That's not tainted with radiation. There's purified water everywhere. Every settlement's got a, a store you could buy booze and liquor yeah. and water from. There's a lot of civilizations. There's the town of Prim and Good Spring. There's, every five feet, there's a town you can go to and sleep there and mm-hmm. you recover. So it makes for a bad survival game. Um, and there's very few dungeons to loot, too. Very few places to scavenge. Fallout 3 had ruins over the place, but Fallout New Vegas, it's society society being rebuilt. So there's not a lot of places you can delve into and scavenge. Fallout New Vegas has the same problem that Fallout 4 and I think Fallout 3 does, where it's like they have six voice actors total. Oh, yeah, that is a problem, yeah. You hear the same voice actors a lot. It's like if you play Skyrim, you, Jarl Balgruff voices literally everyone in the game. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. It gets to the point where you talk to a woman and you almost expect her to be like, I'm Jarl Balgruff, and it's just <laughs> like, okay, great, great. I'm, I'm so happy to hear from you again. Fallout New Vegas had, like, ten generic voices, which they use for basically everything. Yeah. And you can say, oh, what's well, Simon slash John Cutting Batiste slash this character slash boxcars. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all have the same voice actor. Why don't, should we talk about the DLCs in New Vegas? I suppose we could try and nitpick this thing a little bit more, but I'm pretty much tapped out. There's a lot of really good things that we it's, I just, There's so much good stuff about it. Don't, don't. There, <laughs> there's so many good quests that have more than just two endings. Yeah. There's so much good stuff. There's so many. With the boomers, there's like a million different. Or not a million, but. <laughs> With the boomers, there's a bunch of different things you can do with them. There's a whole way that you can sneak into the boomer camp without even going past the artillery. There's like, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you can go find the research for Doc Hildern from Vault 22 and either destroy it or bring it back and then like extort him to make him pay you more for the data mm-hmm. or, you know, just tell him you're not going to give it to him, which makes him angry. Or you can keep Keely alive. And if you got Keely alive, then she'll force you to delete your data unless you, you talk her down. Or unless you're smart enough to convince her that it's good to have. Like, there's so many different variants in all these quests. Yeah, there's... And, and some of these quests are simple, and there's only one solution. But there are a lot of them where there's a lot of ways it can go. Mm-hmm. Best quest design out of any Fallout game I've seen. Yeah, I would agree with that. Fallout New Vegas has the best quest design. And the best main factions, too. Like, Fallout 4 tried to replicate what New Vegas had, where it had four interesting factions you could join with. They all suck. But, well, the ones that fall for you, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Pick one of the DLCs. What are you going to talk about? Well, uh, before before I pick one of the DLCs, I do think it's interesting that they came out They came out chronologically, and they all hinted towards the Lonesome Road, which was the last one. Yeah. They all hinted at the Lonesome Road, which I thought was really cool. Dropping little hints here and there, yeah. enticing you to buy the last DLC. Yep. I thought that was really cool that they all hinted towards the last one. Anyway... Um, Honest Hearts, uh, which one is Honest Hearts? That's the one where you go to Utah. The, the Zion? Yeah, it's Zion. Zion. You meet the Burned Man. That one's pretty cool. I like that one. I think that one is the weakest of the four, though. I think it's, I think it's pretty cool, though. I still enjoy it, but yeah, it's the weakest one. What, what do you say makes it the weakest one? It's very linear. That's true. I but, feel like it's... But I, Lonesome Road is also quite linear. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe it isn't the weakest one. 
Tell you what, I think it's the weakest one. Bad quest design. So many of the quests are fetch quests. Okay, yeah, I understand that. I can see that. You talk to Joshua, he says, go find a map, go find these lunch boxes, you bring it back. He says, go find this. You go find it, you bring it back. And that's all of the quests. And there are, you know, you can go out and explore Zion, but there's no quests that take you out to different places. It's just you exploring. The actual quests in the game are pretty trash. It's been so long since I played it. I, I don't really remember. I do like how you have different endings. You can side with Joshua or side with Daniel for a more peaceful solution. And there's no real best ending, which I do approve of. But yeah, just the binary ending and just fetch quests all over the place. It's got a good concept, but I feel like the execution was very flubbed. We played that mod of... Honest Hearts Reborn. Honest Hearts Reborn, which I did not care for. I, I'm glad we tried it because I still think Honest Hearts is the weakest of the four. And so it was interesting to see what somebody else would do with it. But again, that one was also pretty linear. It did has we, some fun moments though, but we're not talking about the mod. Yeah. Dead Money. Dead Money. I think Dead Money has the weakest one. What makes you say that? Uh, the fact that you just constantly get exploded by stupid fucking radios. Yes, those are annoying. And the enemies that you kill keep coming back to life. Here's the thing. I've never played the original Dead Money. We played the modded version, yes. We played the modded version, which is easier. Mm -hmm. Dead Money is a great concept, and it's actually really fun how you have these three characters, and you could get their individual reputations or fail, and then things go south for you when you're trying to deal with them. A lot of great concepts, a lot of great locations, pretty fun quest design, but yeah, the gameplay of having to navigate the game, this place. Yeah, the gameplay is, it was interesting concept, poor execution. That's why I think it's the weakest one. I think that's true. I don't agree with you that it's the weakest one, but I also agree that, that it's a great concept that was, it's frustrating. And I think a lot of people had a lot of frustrations with, I think, the, the enemy, the, um, the ghost people, because I think there yeah. was a glitch with them where they had infinite perception because it started out with zero and they all had a negative one modifier and it went down to like max perception. Oh, they did the same thing they did to Gandhi and civilization. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that they, they just don't die. But I thought the world was cool. I thought Sierra Maja was a nice place to be. I like how you had a multiple ways to deal with the final boss. Mm -hmm. I like how you could have different endings for each of the in individual characters you were paired with. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of good things to it. Really, it was a really interesting one. As far as non-standard Fallout experiences go, I think that one stayed pretty close in terms of quest design and character interactions. Yeah. Even if it didn't stay as close in terms of like the gunplay and the actual combat. I do think it's funny how so many mods at this point have copied the dead money thing of, you get knocked unconscious and wake up with a bomb collar on. <laughs> They're just like, God, da again? again? How many times has this happened to me? Didn't I they rip that off from Fallout 3's Pit DLC? Probably. I don't remember if you had a bomb collar on in the pit. Oh, yeah, you did, because if you try to run away, you just get blown up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it time to talk about Old World Blues? Sure. For better or worse, it is the most dialogue-heavy one. I think that's mostly in the beginning, because you do start off with basically 30 minutes to a full hour of dialogue and with you're talking with the brains. But after that, it gets a lot better. Well, it depends on how much you want to actually, like, talk to all of them. Because, yeah, you can just go through that and not talk to any of them and just kill all of them. Mm -hmm. But if you want to try to resolve it peacefully, you have to talk to everybody. Right. But I think the worst is in the beginning. After you get hit with all the dialogue in the very beginning, after that, it goes back to a normal amount of talking. Yeah, it's I, I still think it's a lot of talking, but I mean, I, I enjoy it. I don't enjoy how fucking smarmy my brain is. <laughs> Yeah. But that's accurate because I'm sure my own brain actually hates me. Mm -hmm. The gameplay was good, though. It's just another area for you to explore, check mm -hmm. out. All the dungeoneering complaints I have about Fallout New Vegas lacking dungeoneering, that's basically all of what Old World Blues is. Yeah. Going to all these ruins and checking out what's there from the pre-war. Yep. Old World Blues is, uh, it, honestly, in my opinion, it's the best one mm. out of all of them. I, I agree with the general opinion that old world blues is the best dlc yeah it's you're picking from a lot of good ones but i think i'd agree too old world blues does have the most fallouty style gameplay in terms of exploring the old world blues area the, the big mountain mm -hmm. and dealing with all the lobotomites you get to do some classic fallout 3 style dungeoneering 
and you do some quests for the brains, which re resembles Fallout New Vegas. They've each got different reputations, and if you've won their reputation over to your side, you can get to a better ending. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of good things. They took a lot of good things from Fallout 3 and New Vegas and kind of smashed them together to make the Old World Blues DLC. I kind of wish that the the one brain who just speaks in radio static, I kind of wish you could actually fix his voice, but I understand why you don't. I also wish you could, but that's mostly because I hate mute characters in these games. Yeah, there was a uh, there was a lot of pushback when you when you made uh, Charlene. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the mod that I did for Dead Money. Yeah, when I uh, took Charlotte, Charlene, what is her name? Christine. Christine. When you when you gave Christine a robot voice, there was a lot of pushback on that one. I just gave her a robot voice because I didn't really know the best way for us to do that without turning subtitles on, and I didn't want to do that. So I gave her, I, I took the time, I took a day out of my life to give her all these robotic lines. So it sounds like she's speaking with a voice box, but man, people did not like people that. Did, I completely agree with you. I think that that was really the only way to do that without having a bunch of subtitles or having us go, Christine waves her arms frantically and points at her eyeball and then knee. Yeah. It's like, cool, great. If you want to have mute characters in your video game, you have to do it right. And you, <laughs> Fallout New Vegas didn't even give Christine like unique animations of her like drawing circles in the air. She's just staring at you blankly while the subtitles are telling you what she's apparently doing. Yeah. And it sucks. I hate it. I, I keep complaining about mute characters and people keep saying, oh, I think Christine was done well. No, Christine was done poorly too. Christine sucked. I'm sorry. She just stands there. While it says, Christine eats a baguette and then takes a piece of the baguette and flicks it at your face and then draws a circle in the air, finishes it three quarters of the way through and then sneezes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's more of a complaint for dead money, though. Yeah. We've moved on from that. We're talking about the better one, Old World Blues. So anyway, yeah, I kind of wish you could make the, the robot that speaks in static actually talk. I understand why they didn't, but I wish you could make him talk. Anyway. I, I agree. That'd be a nice change. It'd be an, a nice change for people that put in uh, for people that put points into science, or specifically if they had the ro like a robotic technician perk or something like that, yeah. where they could they alone could interact with this character and have a few lines of dialogue with this character that other people just wouldn't be able to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, old world blues. It's fun. I like it. Good DLC. Good DLC. A lot of fun to play. Uh, Lonesome Road. Yeah, Lonesome Road's good. It's okay. It's all right. It's a linear experience. I don't like Eddie. The robot. Eddie. Eddie, yeah. well, however you pronounce his, her name. It's name, yeah. It's it's, it's kind of name. annoying. Yeah. I don't like companions that go beep boop. Again, my same complaint with mute companions. I get so much pushback on not liking Eddie. <laughs> I get so much pushback. How could you not like Eddie? You know why I don't like Eddie? I will tell you why I don't like Eddie. You're going to talk about the battle theme that they play. Ba -na 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 -na. Every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. It's annoying. It is infuriating. Uh, and I don't like that it doesn't talk to you. You just talk to it and it says, and the subtitles say sad beeping. And you're like, what? What do I do with this information? Great, great. Thanks. I'm sorry that you're beeping sadly. <laughs> yeah, I, that's what I, I don't like Eddie. I'm glad that even though you and I hate Eddie for different reasons, we agreed to like treat it like garbage when we play the DLC. Yeah. <laughs> Ulysses is a pretentious shithead. Yeah, but it's almost comically pretentious. I it can kind of forgive him. He's fun. The problem I have with Lonesome Road is that it's the same problem, but to a much lesser degree in Lonesome Road that I had with the Frontiers NCR campaign of war is bad. You should feel bad for what you did. And it's like, I didn't even do that thing. The good thing we were talking about for New Vegas is that you started off and you didn't have a backstory. And then Lonesome Road kind of gave you this backstory with Holtville yeah. and kind of shoehorned it in there. And we, we, no, I don't want that. That's not my character. I already designed my character. Yeah. That's not his backstory. Yeah, I didn't do that. I never did that thing. Well, 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 well it, you did before you got shot in the head, though. Then I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not that. That person's fucking dead. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The person that got shot in the head, their brain matter got all scrambled up. And for all intents and purposes... Unless I'm role playing as someone that destroyed Hopeville for the fucking shits and giggles, <laughs> I, for all intents and purposes, that man is dead. Yeah, I got Phineas Gaged. I'm a whole new person. Yeah, I am not that person anymore. Even if my character did that, I don't know what the fuck was in the package. 
Were you saying that mailmen should open every single package and look what's inside it, and if they don't like it, throw it and yeet it into a fucking canyon? Yeah. No, because that's not what fucking mailmen do. Mailmen deliver the package. Yeah. How dare you deliver this package here that had nuclear missile codes? I didn't know what was in it! Fair criticism. I think Ulysses is still fun. He's got some fun history if you listen to the logs. Yeah. He I, talks about his history with the hair and the braids and how the, the, the people from the Zion DLC were misrepresenting him and perverting its meaning. Yeah. There's a lot of fun stuff to like about him. He has different dialogue. If you've gone deep into all the corners of the DLC and found all of his logs, he'll talk to you about that. He's got special dialogue. Mm -hmm. Depending on who you're siding with, whichever faction you have the best reputation with, he'll have different dialogue for you. If you're playing as a female career that's working for the Legion, he's got some fun quips about that. Like, there's a lot of, of stuff he's, to like about the Ulysses. It's a really... I, what I said about the... Lonesome Road DLC, it's all nitpicky stuff. It's all just completely nitpicky. I, I think it's a great DLC. I think it works very well. But yeah, I have a couple like minor gripes about it. I wish it weren't so linear. I wish it were a lot more open. And I don't like how it gives you a backstory. Yeah. Those are the biggest complaints I have about it. Gameplay, still fun. It's a challenging DLC. It's meant to be like the last challenge of the game. Mm -hmm. So I think it does well in that regard. Um, what, Is there another one? Nope. There's only the four DLCs for New Vegas. And we could talk at great lengths about the various many mods we've played, but yeah. we'll save that for maybe a different day. Yeah, we'll save that for later. So, Fallout 4! We're finally here. What was your reaction when you played Fallout 4? I liked it at first, and over time became started to get more and more disillusioned and disappointed with it. Really? You had the exact opposite experience that I had then. When I first played it, I was like, oh my god, I'm finally getting more Fallout. Yay, hooray, this is the best thing ever. I'm so happy. And then the more I played it, the more I was like, wow, I, I don't fucking care about this story. Oh. At all. So like 10 hours in, you were already disillusioned? Is that what you're saying? I, I would say after my second playthrough of the oh, game. So you were still high on it after the first playthrough. Yeah, I, after the first playthrough, I was like, wow, that was great. And then I played through again, and I got a different faction ending. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is kind of the same ending, but slightly different. Because <laughs> the first time I played through the game, I did Railroad. The oh. first time I played through the game. Okay. And then I played through the game again, and I did Minutemen. And I was like, wow, it's basically the same ending. Yeah. Basically, every ending in the game is exactly the same. For the most part, yeah. And you always have to go talk to Tinker Tom. So even if you're part of the Brotherhood of Steel, <laughs> you have to go to the fucking Railroad and be like, hey, decode this thing. You're telling me... Then on this huge airship with the the second best minds in the Commonwealth, because all the best ones are at the fucking Institute jerking themselves off and building fucking robots, nobody can figure out how to decode this stupid fucking thing. So that was when your opinions started to sour a bit, when you realized most of the branching pathways, the different factions were largely the same or different? No, that wasn't. The, the thing that really soured me on Fallout 4 was that you... Where's Sean? I don't care. Ah. I don't care about where Sean is. I don't want to go find Sean. I want to solve the problems of the Commonwealth. Well, you could ignore that in New Vegas as well. You know, your plot says go find Benny, but you can just ignore that. In fact, I didn't really talk about that, but I believe you told me that in New Vegas, you for the longest time never went to Vegas because you thought that was the end game. Yeah, So that's you explored true. the majority of the mojave wasteland and then you went to vegas and found out oh there's the rest of like there's an entire half a game here yeah so you could ignore sean yeah and to be honest that's usually what i do is i just don't do that mm -hmm. i feel like there's so many people in fallout 4 that are just so stupid <laughs> they're so like the reasons for them doing stuff okay spoiler alert <laughs> the leader of the institute is actually your son who for some Dumbass reason, at some point, 60 years before the game takes place, the Institute was like, oh no, we want to make synths, but we don't have someone that's never been exposed to radiation. So they found a vault with a bunch of people in it and then stole a baby and killed everybody else in there. If you're going to start talking about the plot, I think we can start even at a more simpler level. The Institute exists. What is the Institute? There are a society of people that are building robots and they're replacing people in the wasteland with these robots. Why? Why indeed? 
They never really explain why because, they need these robots. Because they're part of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they've been underground for so long, they don't know how to interact with people anymore. Except that there's literally thousands of them down there, and they have plenty of people to interact. What they're trying to do is they're trying to do an end justifies the means thing, where they're scientists and they're like, yeah, but we, we're, we're trying to rebuild the world, so we have to send these robots out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but why? How does that help rebuild the world? Because, have you seen the robots? They're really cool. The plot of Fallout 4 is hot garbage, and people have done hours-long analyses destroying it, because it sucks ass. One of the things that I don't like about the Institute is that they have a whole group in the Institute that is the Institute Retention Bureau. <laughs> or the Synth, sorry, the Synth Retention Bureau. And their only job is to go out and find synths that have escaped and bring them back. Cool. I would love to do missions for them. So you do missions for them. But the synths that you go out and find are literally the Gen 1 and Gen 2 synths that are beep boop and robot. That instantly you're like, that's a robot. <laughs> They're not the super... It's not... You could have done so much with that. You could have had it be like a fucking murder mystery thing where you have to go out and you have to figure out which one of these is a synth because you're not, you're, you're not sure. But no, it's fucking... Beep, boop, and robot. Robot, go back home. Okay. Robot, robot goes back home. Robot override code. Beep, boop, complying with order. And then they're like, oh, well, we, these synths are expensive. They're really hard to make. And then if you go down to where they make the synths, they're fucking pumping them out. They're coming out like every 30 goddamn seconds. There's another synth coming off the line. Mm hmm. Yeah, if we're gonna How keep. How fucking expensive are these things to make then? If we're gonna rant about this plot, let's keep on ranting. Why are we making these synths so they can do the jobs that we can't do? The, why are you sending me to do all these jobs? Why, not, why aren't you sending these Gen 3 synths? Oh, we don't trust the synths. We just trust Kellogg. And he's dead because you murdered him. So now we trust you. None of it makes sense. None of it makes any fucking sense. Father is like, well, after they took me away from you and mother and they killed mother, I had them go back and release you so that you, I could meet you. Well, then why the fuck didn't you just wait for me right outside as soon as I woke up? Well, because I wanted to see what kind of man you were. So what? You, you just assumed I wouldn't get killed in the wasteland with all these hostile enemies. You assumed I'd have a favorable opinion of the Institute when I'm interacting with all these people whose lives are being made worse by the Institute. None of what you're doing makes any sense. Which is why every single time I play through the game, if I ever actually make it to Sean, I just kill him immediately because I'm like, you're a fucking moron. You're a goddamn idiot. You're, the old son of mine is going to be this fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, big stupid idiot. Anyway, we're getting into the minutia of the Fallout 4 details in the story, and I haven't even talked about my first experience yet. I think when I started to get sour on Fallout 4 was the, after my second playthrough and also the settlement building. I just don't fucking care. It's annoying. It's so infuriating. And then you build a settlement. I thought I built an area. All these people are going to live here. It's going to be great. They're going to have, I, I'm, I'm going to have all these people here. They're maintaining the crops. They're demanding security. Oh no, they need help being, okay, well, they're being attacked. Fine. So I show up there, I drive off the raiders and then I'll just put a bunch of turrets up. Mm -hmm. Got a bunch of turrets everywhere. 20 minutes later, this settlement's being attacked. Fine. So I go back there. <laughs> Nothing's happening. And then like three raiders show up later. And then three raiders show up. The turrets mulch them. And they're, well, thank God you were here. I didn't fucking do anything. Yep. <laughs> why, why do you keep, stop calling me back here. You don't need my help. You have a, you have six shotguns in your inventory because I gave them to you. There's <laughs> missile turrets everywhere. Laser turrets over there. There's more turrets there. You have three super mutants here that I have put here to help you defend the area. And you're still, oh no, we need his help. <laughs> What three super mutants did you recruit? Just like from like mods. Sorry. Okay. I, just, just like I, I've, I've made this town is so overpowered now that you would have to be completely insane to think that you could try to take over this town. Yeah. And they still are just like, oh, we need your help. Oh. I, I don't like that every faction in the game is like, oh my God, I, you know, I know we just met and that I'm supposed to be the leader of the Minutemen, but you're in charge of the Minutemen now. Oh, uh, I know that I know that you just like broke in here and that we're a super secret organization called the railroad, but also you're in charge of the railroad now. Mm -hmm. I do appreciate that the the Brotherhood of Steel is the org only organization that's like, yeah, you're going to make it to a paladin and that's as fucking high as you're going to make it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. You want to be in charge of the Brotherhood of Steel? Yeah, <laughs> tough titties. <laughs> you're a paladin and that's it. Yep. 
I feel like they tried to give us a good base experience, but it falls flat. Yeah. So I'll talk about my first interaction with this game. I was really excited. I was riding high. I loved Fallout New Vegas. I was excited for Fallout 4. They had teased it. They had gotten my hopes up. New Vegas was great. Fallout 4 is going to be great. I've seen all these trailers. It's going to be good. And I played it, and I hated it after two hours. I seriously didn't get through a full playthrough. I don't remember which faction I sided with first. I hated Fallout 4. It sucks so hard. It fails so hard to capture everything that New Vegas succeeded at. Mm -hmm. The quests all suck. They're all fetch quests. The writing is all bad. And there's so many damn radiant quests. What a terrible addition. And the base building I didn't care about. A terrible addition. It's everything I hated. It It was just terrible. I hated it. Yeah. And my opinion of Fallout 4 was negative for so long until I finally accepted that Fallout 4 fails at being a proper role-playing game. It's still a decent enough game you can play on your own, and then I could finally get some enjoyment out of it. But it sucks so hard! That's the only way I can play that game now, is by just being like, it's not an RPG. Or if it is an RPG, then the game ends when I say the game is over. Mm -hmm. The way I basically play this game now... It, and I, I basically just do the same fucking thing every single time. The way I basically play this game now is I was released from the vault. doesn't matter how. I was released from the vault. I never had a son. I never had a wife. <laughs> I don't care about any of that shit. Or I never had a son and Kellogg killed my wife. Sure. Go with that. Go through the game until I kill Kellogg and then fucking Piper and I just live in the Boston library and turn it into an actual functional library. Mm. That is how I fucking play this game now. Considering how open Fallout New Vegas was, you didn't have a backstory, you didn't have a family, you just had you and whatever you wanted yourself to be. Yeah. And then Fallout 4 gave you a spouse, and a child, and a life, and they told you what your occupation was, and then they sent you on a quest to find your family, and the majority of the game is finding your family until you find out about the Institute, and then it finally starts focusing on the Institute, but then your family is tied into it, so now you're focusing on your family again, and I just hate everything about that. Yeah. There's so much stuff in Fallout 4 that is just absolutely infuriating that, like, Preston just makes you in charge of the Minutemen. Preston, yeah, we're talking about each individual faction, how much we hate them. The Minutemen, Preston just makes you general of the Minutemen. Uh, you, he's known you for a grand total of probably, like, 20 minutes at that point. Mm-hmm. And he, sec- he sends you on fetch quests that never end, literally never-ending quests to go do Radiant Quest for settlements. Just every... You finish one, I've got word of another settlement that needs our ha- it's It's a fucking meme. You know it. Malik knows it. We all fucking know the meme of, I've got word of another, another settlement. But it's a meme that's rooted in history, because literally every time we talk to him, there's a 90% chance he's going to say that line. Yep. I'll mark it on your pit boy. God fucking damn it, Preston. There's so much other stuff, too, that's in the game that is just not utilized. The um, fucking combat zone, you do nothing with. There's a whole arena that is there. It's set up. Like, there was going to be... You could have fought in the arena or just fucking taken bets on it. Mm-hmm. And it, you do nothing with you. The first time you show up there, you kill all the raiders. Like, the game is just like, oh, that's cute. You thought you were you thought you were going to do... You thought you were going to do some some betting on, like, on like fighting, on, like, cage fighting. That's cute. No, you killed everyone. So we're going to take a little divergence now and talk about how these quests are awful. And yes, all of the quests are awful. Not just the ones that are poorly written, because the vast majority of them are poorly written, but even the Radiant quests are all... like I, 90% of the quests are go to X location and grab an item, or go to X location and kill everyone there. Yeah. You role play... Or sometimes you get the combination quests where it's go to Hardware Town, kill everyone, and grab paint. Uh, you do... Bring up a point, though. Fallout 4 does make you roleplay as somebody who murders everything. You can't really play that game as a passive. You could try, but you'd have to sneak around basically everything. You have to kill everyone. Unlike Fallout New Vegas, where you could not kill anyone. You could beat that game with basically zero kills to your name. Yep. Back to the factions, though. We were talking about the Minutemen and how much they suck. Yeah. So, yeah, the Minutemen get more powerful the more, like, bases you build or the more settlements you build. But you don't ever see them recruiting anybody. And the Minutemen just feel so generic good guy. Like, what's the flaw of the Minutemen? There isn't one. They're so goody two-shoes. They they, they are the regulators from Fallout 3 taken to their illogical conclusion. They're they're just all just so goody. Preston is such a goody two-shoes yes-man companion. He's so boring. Yeah. 
which in a game that's that that is supposed to pride itself on story that is the that is the like one of the biggest cardinal sins is just being boring he is very boring yes since i'm talking about how boring the Minuteman is and how they feel like the regulators uh we'll talk about the gunners just a little side quest here talking about the gunners they brought back talent company from fallout 3 that mysterious group of people that employs about a thousand to two thousand people that are hostile on site and shoot you they're back they're called the gunners but they'll just shoot you on site because yes because for reasons yeah no no explained reasons they just the, just shoot you. The thing is, the gunners are the gunners are sold as mercenaries in Fallout 4. They're supposed to be mercenaries that like, anybody can hire mm-hmm. if they have the right amount of money. So why would they just immediately shoot at me? If I'm walking up to a gunner camp without a weapon, mm-hmm. just me walking up to a gunner camp, how do you know I'm not trying to hire you to hire them? No. Yeah. Why can't I work for the gunners? Why can't I hire the gunners? The Gunners are everything wrong with Talon Company from Fallout 3, but I can at least forgive it in Fallout 3 because that was the first entry. Fallout 4, bringing them back, is dumb as hell. There's there's other stuff that's really stupid about Fallout about Fallout 4, like why are there super mutants in Boston? Now, I realize that in the game, the reason there's super mutants is because the Institute made them. But like, why? Why would the Institute make super mutants? What's the point? It just feels like they're shoehorning super mutants into everything. To that end, there shouldn't be super mutants in Fallout 3 either, but I don't know. Well, Zach, since super mutants are limited in their creation, since they require FEV virus, which is a supply that's dwindling, you can't find it in vaults anymore, and since the Institute's been destroyed so they can't make it anymore, and now that we have the cure from Vigil, so there's an anti-super mutant medication well, everyone can take. If you do that. Yes. So now we shouldn't have any more super mutants because the supply has been dwindling. We can't make any more. And now we've all got cures. So we should never see any more super mutants ever again. Except that we will. Probably. Because super mutants are just part of Fallout now. Yup. Can never, we can never grow as a series anymore. No, you just have to have the same, the same things over and over again. You have to have the Brotherhood of Steel in there, even though again, the Brotherhood of Steel were only in California. So why the fuck are they all the way over here? That's a good pivot point, Zach. We were talking about the main factions. Let's talk about the Brotherhood. Or as they appear in Fallout 4, the Enclave Light. Yeah, they're basically... The Brotherhood is unfortunately Enclave Light in this game. They just want you to kill everything that shows the slightest tinge of radiation, which is exactly what happened with the Enclave in Fallout 3. Anything that's not pure human needs to die. Ghouls, super mutants, ask no questions, murder them all. Synths too. I can understand them wanting to kill synths. That actually fits with the Brotherhood because synths are basically technology run amok. Hmm. It's, you have zero control over this thing. Well, unless you get a recall code for it. But you have zero control over a toaster with fucking laser guns. Considering how poorly the Institute is written and how they're just making these replicants They're to generic kid- yeah to kidnap people for no discernible reason and they don't even seem to understand why they're doing it they're just making these things to kill people and take over their bodies yeah the the brotherhood is entirely within their right to hate the synths yeah i get it i fully what i 100 understand that out of out of all the factions in fallout 4 i think i, I probably understand the brotherhood the most they are probably the least poorly written and that's oh, quite a low bar, I guess. Yeah. Your alternatives are the, the, the Minutemen, men who are goody two-shoes. Where everyone has to get together. Everyone has to. We have to work together, you guys. There's no downside to the Minutemen, which is boring as fuck. Maybe I want a little bit of subtlety. They could have done literally anything with the Minutemen, and they chose to do none of it. So you got the Minutemen, who are boring as shit. You've got the, the Railroad, who is... Oh, we haven't talked about the railroad yet, but they are also poorly written. They're poorly written because they're t- taking the opposite side of that, which is the synths deserve more rights than humans. They deserve to live out their life, free will. Yep, sure. And maybe you could make an argument for that if the synths themselves as a concept weren't so terribly implemented. Yeah, we were talking about the Brotherhood. So yeah, the Brotherhood is just... The Brotherhood's follower, who is Dance, is just so poorly done. Is he? I don't really think I I've used like, him that much. So basically, have you have you followed Dance's quest through to its completion? I haven't. No, I... I Regardless of what happens, mm-hmm. at the end of his quest, he gets kicked out of the Brotherhood. 
and he either he either dies or you never use him again. For for all intents and purposes, Paladin Dance dies at the end of his quest. Okay, jeez, is he not allowed to use power armor at the end of his quest? Does he deserve? Does he work as a very poor companion? No, you just can't have him with you. Oh, he just leaves your party? He leaves completely. Oh, and just, geez. And just fucking just lives in this bunker from now on. <laughs> oh, okay. If you if you are doing a Brotherhood of Steel playthrough, you can't have Paladin dance with you. No, you, there's no way to get around that. He just leaves your party if you do if his If you quest. do the speech check where he stays alive, Elder Maxon will not let you have him with you. <laughs> Elder Maxon is like, no, you, he cannot be a part of the Brotherhood anymore. Elder Maxon, who allows Dick Valentine on his ship when you bring him? Yeah. <laughs> Elder Maxon just straight up is like, no, you can't have him as part. He, he is not allowed on the Pridwin ever again. Okay. If he shows up on the Pridwin, I'll fucking kill him. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so I, I really feel like they should have done with Paladin Dance. If you're doing a Brotherhood playthrough, that information about Paladin Dance never comes up. Okay. The only way that, the way they should have done this is the only way he gets kicked out of the Brotherhood is if you're playing as one of the other factions. Okay. It never should have... You should have been able to have him as a companion for the entire game. Because basically, you start getting towards the end of the game, he's not a val... He, you can't use him anymore. The fact that you can't complete the Brotherhood campaign with the Brotherhood companion is kind of egregious. Yeah, it's just baffling. The Minutemen have Preston Garvey. Yeah. The Brotherhood have... Paladin Dance. Mm -hmm. The Institute have that robot that I never used. Who is just the most boring fucking... He's basically the, their version of... Preston Garvey? Preston Gar he's so fucking boring. He's generic. I think he's got no soul either. So he's like... He's, instead yeah, of he, is, he is a synth. So he just literally is, I am robot. So instead of being like Preston Garvey, where Preston Garvey's like, Oh, come on, gang. We gotta get the gang together and do some good deeds. And the this highest guy praise you can get from him is, I don't dislike traveling with you as a companion. Isn't the, the companion... Kind of along the lines of, why are you giving food to that small child? Just because it's starving? We needed that food. How dare you? How dare you? We could have used that food back at the Institute. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, basically, if you don't play it, if you don't play as an Institute fucking... If you don't play as a robot, the robot doesn't like you. Yeah. Just like, why? Like, he's more robotic than the actual robot companion you get, who's got overwhelming amounts of charisma. Yeah. So, I understand that the... That the the Brotherhood of Steel wants to destroy the Institute. I fucking get it because the Institute's like cartoonishly evil. Yeah. They're either cartoonishly evil or cartoonishly misguided, depending on how you want to look at it. They either have lost so much touch with reality that they have no idea what's going on above the surface. Yeah. So they're just like, dip, 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 just send more robots out. We got to figure out what's going on up there. Because yep. we're a bunch of nerds that have never been outside of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Come on, Institute. Touch grass. Yeah. I, I, I think it's really fucking stupid that the Brotherhood of Steel, like their end their end game is getting Liberty Prime running. Cause it's like I wow. I think that's a nice callback. I think it's a nice callback, but that's their fucking that's That's it, huh? It's Fallout 3, huh? So we're doing Fallout 3 again? Yeah, we're doing Fallout 3 again, yeah. Doing Fallout 3 again? I'm sorry, you're not Elder Lions. I don't fucking care about you, Maxon. <laughs> you're kinda whiny. Yeah, you go you go find Dr. Lee. Oh, yeah, that's right. Who, Dr. Lee comes back, too. Who, guess what, is working for the Institute now yeah. because the Brotherhood was too stupid. But you go down there and you basically either go, if you don't come work for the Brotherhood, I'll fucking kill you. Or you should come work for the Brotherhood again. Boy, wasn't it fun last time? <laughs> so, yeah, it's just you fucking bring Liberty Prime back again. Liberty Prime, it's another Fallout game. Time for you to work. Yes, dear. <laughs> time for your cinematic gameplay experience where the player follows behind you and watches you do everything. Wow, boy, this sure is fun. I'm enjoying this. Yeah, it's just, it's boring. It's just so boring. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I guess the Brotherhood is probably one of the least, they're probably one of the better factions in Fallout 4, but... That's not saying much. It's not a very high bar to clear. Yeah. Railroad sucks, and... The uh, Railroad sucks because the Railroad is the polar opposite of the Brotherhood of Steel, where synths have more rights than humans. Something like that, yeah. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. The Railroad has one of the better companions in the game, which is Deacon. He's, he's got some personality, yeah. Deacon has a lot of personality. I really like the fan theory that Deacon is the Lone Wanderer from Fallout 3. <laughs> I think that's a really fun fan theory. I really like it. They, mm. they drop a few hints there. I think it's interesting. I think it's really stupid that the way you find the, the, the railroad is by following the freedom trail and then you get to a thing and it's, what's the password for it? Oh, gee, I don't know. Could it be railroad? Yeah, they, they have a very dumb introduction. How'd you find your way in here? I opened the front door. I followed the red line you have. Yeah. What's the password? Password. You're in. 
what bothers me, it, it ties more into the synths too. Like we're trying to give these synths rights. Like we want them to have the freedom that they they want. These synths want freedom. They want to escape from the Institute. They want to live their lives. Do they though? Because sometimes you find synths that know that they're made by the Institute. And a lot of times you find synths and they have no clue that they're synths. Sometimes yeah. they have goals. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're just replacing the farmers for the sake of being a farmer. Like you have no clue what a synth is because it's so poorly defined. They're apparently replacing people and they're near perfect copies. But you find so many, in so many instances of people saying that person is obviously a synth because they're acting completely different. They gotta, they're a completely different person. That's not a perfect replication then. Yeah. Because the synths are the synths are all individuals. They have a soul. They're all people. Right. And right. whether they know it or want, whether they know it or not, they have to be freed. So their solution to freeing the synths is to blow up the institute, the place that's making the synths. It's like what, you realize they're still making more synth. If they all have a soul and they're all people, they're still making synths down there. And those are also humans, and they have souls. Those are also humans. No, the humans don't count though. It's the synths that matter. I mean. Again, the, the Institute is so poorly written that they are so cartoonishly evil that it actually is kind of justified to go full genocide on them. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I My personal opinion of the synths in Fallout 4 is that they're not people. They don't have souls because every single one of them can be shut down with a recall code. If you want to argue that souls exist, then you're going to have a tough time with that whole thing. But they're sentient life forms. It's a sentient life form, but it's a sentient life form that I can walk up to and say, ravioli, ravioli, give me the formulae. And they go, beep, boop, setting program back to normal. Just because you can kill them so easily doesn't mean they don't have life. You could murder somebody and they stop existing. Doesn't mean just because it's simple to kill them, you should do it. I'm not saying that's not killing them, though. I don't know. This is again. We're we're going on a whole tangent about whatever. I don't. We don't need to talk. We're about talking it. about the root conflict: AI versus humanity, which is, I'm pretty sure is what the first idea was for Fallout 4. This was what Bethesda wanted to explore. We want to explore this concept. Let's make a terrible video game around it. Let's make a terrible. Let's make a faction that doesn't actually explore any of those whatsoever. Yeah. The Minutemen, the Brotherhood, the Railroad. What's the fourth fact? Oh, yeah, the Institute. And the Institute. God, let's not even talk about the Institute. We've already ranted about they're, how stupid yeah, they are. They're cartoonishly evil. They don't make any sense whatsoever. They're led by Father, who's also your son, and he expected you to survive across the wasteland for some reason. He's all mad that Kellogg killed one of his parents. And it's like, well, why didn't you just kill him then? You, you could have killed him at literally any point. I wanted you to do it. I thought it might be cathartic. Yeah. You wanted me to do your fucking dirty work for you, huh? <laughs> what do you actually like about Fallout 4? The gunplay is better. The gunplay is better. The movement and gunplay are better, but it's like I you could have just you could have made it just as clunky as Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3 and I would have loved it if it had if it had actually been a role-playing game like Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3. Mhm. Mm I'm willing to sacrifice stuff for a better story. Yeah. The crafting system was kind of fun. I like making weapon mods. I like that yeah. the resources you find can be used to make weapons better. It actually encourages you to pick up stuff, and then ev almost every companion you have berates you for picking up things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is infuriating. Mm. I like the fact that at least Piper is just like, what's that for? I think the weakest Fallout New Vegas companion was Lily. So I'm glad that they actually had time to make a Super Mutant Companion and do even less with them in Fallout like, 4. Like, God, he's strong, sucks so bad. I like Kate because Kate feels more real to me. She's got personality, unlike some of them. Kate is like, why the fuck are you helping these stupid dirt farmers? <laughs> like, why? Yeah. What the, the, If they're not going to help themselves, then fuck them. <laughs> Or she's like, if you do help them, when you ask for more money, she likes that. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> I, I will say that one of the things that I do like about Fallout 4 is I actually like the companions in Fallout 4. Except for Strong and uh, Preston Garvey yeah. and the Institute companion X XMXMX. XJ whatever. Uh, and Paladin Dance. No, Paladin Dance is okay. Okay. He's okay. It's just it's he has a really unsatisfying end. Okay, and uh, the the one child from Fallout Three is back as oh companion. McCready McCready's okay. He's yeah. he's kind of bland, but he's all right. Okay, okay. Nick Valentine. Nick Valentine's probably. I mean, if we can go through the list of companions, Nick Valentine is great. Piper is great. Curie. 
I never used Curie. I never. Curie found... is a beautiful little cinnamon bun, and she's too pure for this world. I never found Curie. I don't. I don't. I don't know anything about I her. I love Curie. One of my favorite things that, because Curie is so innocent, because she's been stuck in a vault for two hundred years. Again, you're spoiling me, but still, she's so innocent. That like when you mur- when you kill a bunch of people and you start looting their corpses, she's like, and now we put the things in plastic baggies for the police to come. Yes, <laughs> it's just like, oh, Curie, oh, you sweet, sweet little cinnamon bun. I like the companions. The game is really pretty. I think it looks great. It does, but the environments aren't varied enough. No, not really. Between the main area and then like. The, the blistered edge corner of the game. Oh, the glowing sea? Yeah, I think those are the only two environments. It's the just, glowing sea isn't radioactive enough. Well, there's that. I don't, I don't know. I've barely been there, like I said. I really don't think the glowing sea is radioactive enough. Okay. Because, like, you can just... You can walk through the glowing sea just by dumping some rad X and just walking around in there, and you're fine. There's other areas in the game that are more radioactive than the glowing sea is. I'll take your word on that. I said... I wanted to talk about the good things from Fallout 4, and then we went on another 30-minute tirade about the bad things. Half of the companions are good. The crafting system is fun. The game looks nice. The gunplay feels better. I like how they added sprinting and grenade hotkey. Yeah, that's those those two are really nice. Sprinting, grenade hotkey are both amazing. I like being able to make individual pieces of armor. That's actually fun to upgrade each part. And then you find legendary pieces and you want to upgrade those parts. And each time you play through the game, you end up with a different looking character's armor set because of what you can find can be very varied. There is there is a lot of good stuff. I, we've basically done nothing but shit on Fallout 4 for the last hour. There's a lot to talk about that is bad and shouldn't be replicated in any sequel. Yeah. Have you played any of the DLCs? I haven't in any significant capacity. Outside of Automatron, which we did on the channel. Yeah, there's not a lot to Automatron. Automatron's kind of lame. Automatron was a fun little half-hour adventure. I'd say it was okay for that. The problem with with some of the DLCs of this game is they're not DLCs as much as they are crafting unlocks. There's only two notable DLCs for Fallout 4 outside of Automatron, which kind of counts, but not really. It's kind of half-assed. There's Nuka World and mm-hmm. Far Harbor. Far Harbor I have actually played through and finished. And Far Harbor, the environment itself has more atmosphere than all of Fallout 4 put together. Damn. It is so cool running around. it. Just the atmosphere of that area is so cool. It kind of reminds me of Point Lookout a little bit, but it's got a very like Lovecraftian eldritch horror theme to it. It's really cool. My problem with it is that it, it seems to be like, well, you could be a synth though. Is that a plot point that's repeated a lot? Yeah, it's yeah. it's very heavy on, but you you might be a synth. Continuing the awful, awful plot line from Fallout 4. Yeah, it's, it, it kind of has a do androids dream of electric sheep vibe going on, which I'm not a huge fan of. Mm. Um, I, I suppose it's possible, but I whatever. Yeah, Point Lookout is pretty cool. I feel like the endings for Point Lookout, I'm not, I'm not going to spoil them for you. I feel like the endings are kind of unsatisfying. I heard there were more skill Did checks. Did I call it Point Lookout? Uh, yeah. yeah. Far Harbor. <laughs> I heard there were more skill checks in that, in that DLC. Is that true? There are more skill checks in it. That's good. Um, But I feel like the endings are kind of unsatisfying. Well, then it's just living up to Fallout 4's legacy then. Yeah. Speaking of which, Fallout 4 didn't actually have a slideshow either. No, you just get the same ending. Kind of. It's the exact same ending, no matter which faction you choose. It's slightly different if you took the Institute. It's it. It's yeah. not, again, Fallout New Vegas set a high bar, and Fallout 4 ran face-first into it. Mm-hmm. And then Nuka World, which I actually did play the first hour of. I was going to play it on the channel, and I was doing my solo run many, many years ago, but I never continued it. I have not played Nuka World. I'm familiar with how the whole thing goes. My girlfriend's played it quite... My girlfriend plays a lot of Fallout 4. <laughs> So she's played, she's played through, and she has like basically the same gripes about it as I do. She, she likes to play kind of the same video games many, many times. Yeah. So she basically play, it goes Skyrim and then Fallout and then Bloodborne and then back to Skyrim. <laughs> so <laughs> she has played through Nuka World. I, Nuka World has got such a piss poor ending. All right. All I know was the first hour, like I said, and the hour was, the hour was linear 
and then I think it opens up once I get past the first hour, but I didn't actually get further than that. It seems to have a pretty fun premise. Yeah. It looks like it could be a fun environment to explore. I'm anticipating exploring it with you when we get around to it in the series. I can't really give a detailed... I'm looking forward to exploring it. Exploring it seems fun. Um, the problem I have with Nuka World is... Remember how I got really mad at the end of War Trash and at the end of the the Frontier DLC? Specifically because it's like, hey, you did all this stuff. Yay, the NCR loves you. Oh no, JK, they hate you now. You're now an enemy of the NCR because you aligned yourself with terrorists. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what happens at the end of Nuka World. Cool. I can't wait to be disappointed by that. Yeah. Is the gameplay at least fun, you know? It's 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 decent. All right. It's there, there's a lot of exploration. No, that's so always fun. I can understand. It. There's an area you can go to. Oh, don't spoil it. Okay. All right, we'll get around to that. Okay. We can't evaluate that in full right now. We'll have to get around to that. It's again, it's a really unsatisfying ending. Seems to be a running theme for me personally. Fallout 4. It's it's an enjoyable game. Do I love it? Not really. It's a bad role playing game because it makes you play as a specific character, makes you follow a linear storyline. And then there's the speech. Oh, yes, they've changed how dialogue works. Oh, God, yeah, I completely forgot that I was going to bring that up. Yeah, the dialogue. You have many dialogue. When you have a conversation with someone and they want you to do something, you have many options to choose from. And by many, I mean four. And by four, I mean two. And by two, I mean one. Yeah. Because your options are yes, yes in a different tone, sarcastic yes, and no, but actually I'll come back and do it later, so yes. Uh, yeah, I think everyone knows about that by now. The dialogue system is completely brain dead. It's so dumb. It's so limiting. It's incredibly limiting. And then in the base game, if you don't install this mod, it'll be like, you'll go to talk to someone and it'll be like, hey, do you want this orange? And you'll say, yes, I would like that orange. And your character goes, yeah, you fucking piece of shit. Why don't you ram that orange down my asshole? <laughs> Yeah. It's just like, wow, that is not at all what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. Unlike in Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3, where you're selecting the exact dialogue your character is choosing, in Fallout 4, you're just selecting a couple of key words. Yeah. There's a point in the game, which I, I think the sarcastic answer is very funny, but the first time I played the game, I didn't know this was the, the sarcastic answer, because you run up to a character, and he says, I'm so thirsty, I need a new Coca-Cola, and I went, I will offer you some water. Mm-hmm. What your character does is go, drink some water in the most hostile way possible, <laughs> which is very funny when you expect that's what you're going to say. Yeah. When you're trying to play a character that is the common man and compassionate mm -hmm. towards other people and you have Piper with you <laughs> and you say that. Yeah. And Piper goes, just give the guy a Nuka Cola. I'm like, that's not what I fucking meant to say to him. I was trying to be nice. Yeah. I don't have a Nuka Cola. I can offer you some water. Can I offer you a water in this trying time? Yeah, and it's just that, like, stuff like that happens a lot. Yeah. Where it's you think you're going to be saying something, and that's not what you're going to be fucking saying. Because the sarcastic answer isn't always in the same spot. Sometimes the sarcastic answer moves to the other side of the screen, yeah. and it doesn't tell you that's the sarcastic answer. And sometimes it's not even sarcasm. It's just you being an asshole. Sometimes you're just an asshole. I will say... That Fallout 4 has my favorite line delivery in the entire Fallout series. Oh, yeah. Which is when you go, it's part of a certain quest. You go to talk to a synth, and the synth says, what are you doing here? The male voice actor has my favorite line delivery, which is, yeah, I've got an order for two large pepperonis and a calzone. Name's fuck you. <laughs> and I don't even do it justice because his line delivery is so good. <laughs> He did such a good job. Uh, some good moments. Not gonna, not gonna lie. There are some good moments in that game. <sighs> Settlement building is just a chore. I hate doing it. Man, when I would play that game, anytime I would go to talk to Preston, and he's like, yeah, there's an area over here that would be great for a new settlement. I'm just like, God damn it. And even when you and I are playing the game right now, we completely and unabashedly cheat. We turn on God mode, pop up 18 beds, 300 turrets, put a bunch of water fountains everywhere. All the needs are taken care of. And we still get notifications that our settlement is under attack. It needs our help. It needs our help. The people here aren't happy. I, I don't care. Yeah. I don't fucking care. And like the weapons variety is so... I, this I, Again, this is something that only I'm going to care about. The weapons variety in Fallout 4 is trash. 
It's not very big, huh? It's so lame. You've got pipe weapons, which encompasses all of the pipe rifles and pistols. So pipe weapons, pipe revolvers, 10 mil pistol, pipe shotgun. I don't think there's a pipe shotgun now. No, there's no pipe shotgun. That got cut out of the game. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, there was going to be pipe shotguns, and then they decided that they didn't want to. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to put all the pipe weapons together. Pipe weapons, 10 mil pistol, and I don't think there's any other pistols. <laughs> hmm. Wait, really? Huh. Now that you bring that up, I can't think of any. There's got to be some, though. The assault rifle, which is just a fucking hot mess. The combat rifle. Combat the- shotgun. I know there's a sniper rifle. I, the I, hunting I, rifle. I distinctly remember that there was a sniper rifle because I tried it and it took like four or five headshots to kill any enemy and I realized this is garbage. The the hunting rifle. That's what you're thinking of. Okay. Oh, side-by-side shotgun, minigun, and then some other unique weapons. Mm-hmm. I think there might be more melee weapons and unarmed weapons in Fallout 4 than there are guns. Yeah, probably. That would not surprise me in the slightest. The power fist is just a... Again, I'm, nobody's going to care about this but me. The power fist, if you actually look at how the power fist is supposed to work in the game, it would rip your, it would dislocate your hand from your wrist. That is how the power fist would work in that game. Mm. No longer do you get punchy or the ballistic fist. You get this fucking thing that just is the dumbest looking power fist in the world. Oh, look, we're ranting about how much Fallout 4 sucks again. How did we get here? It's because it's not good. There are so many different pals we could branch off of the conversation to talk about how much it's bad. And we get comments all the time. You don't see them all the time because I am the one who's mostly checking the comments. But we get comments occasionally. Why are you still playing Fallout New Vegas? This game is 10 years old. Why are you playing Fallout 4? It's because 10 years on, Fallout New Vegas is still the better game. Well, let's for a second, let's talk about mods because let's talk about how fucking difficult it is to mod Fallout 4. It's not that difficult. It's just the general instability. Yeah, it's that's primarily what it is, because it's actually easier to mod Fallout New Vegas than it is to mod Fallout 4. Yeah, but we can't talk too much about mods, because that's going to be a whole other eight-hour conversation. No, that's what, that's, what I was, that's what I wanted to say, though, is that it's, it's harder to mod Fallout 4. Yeah. Like, American Weirdo even said it in one of his mods. He's like, yeah, this was going to be a Fallout 4 mod, but it's really, the, the gek for that is trash. Oh, you're talking about making mods. Yeah. Yeah, I've looked into making mods for Fallout 4 myself, and it is intimidating looking at it the conversation trees alone are much more complex and i hate everything about it well i don't want to keep ragging on how much i hate fallout 4 because i actually don't it's just not good we thought fallout 4 was the lowest the series could go until fallout 76 oh my god take everything bad about fallout 4 and then multiply it everything good about fallout 4 make that bad too yeah there's no good quest design. There's no good gunplay. They brought back weapon and armor durability, and it sucks complete ass. Weapon crafting now takes a million components, which you never find things for. Mm-hmm. Also, you don't get mods for that weapon unless you break it down. You want to do this quest and this side quest and this event quest? No, we're going to keep on popping notifications in the corner of your eye. Fallout 76 is a fucking mess. I hate it. We have a whole video. We we played multiple games of Fallout 76. You and I played it for a few hours. We have five or six videos on the channel about it. And there are times where we start having fun. But the overall experience... And then it, it does not last long. It, it doesn't last very long, no. And there's a lot of reasons why that is. There's a bad design all over the place. The quest design is terrible. Apparently, everybody in the pre-war went around dictating their lives into a microphone all the time Mm -hmm. or writing them down on notes for some reason. Fallout 76, when it was released, was such a scuffed, muddled mess with scam after scam. Uh, Telling you about the canvas bag was a whole controversy. Oh, my God. There was a controversy about the plastic bottles. And we're not going to do anything about it. There's so many things we could talk about and how how much of an absolute failure it was on release. And that's not even talking about the game itself. Just the marketing and the release was just riddled with terrible decisions. And the game itself is awful to play. I have tried so many times to get into it. Even if you stop trying to treat it like a role-playing game, even if you treat it like the dumbed-down game it is, it sucks so hard. Nothing about it is fun. I, I feel like at this point, anytime we talk about it, we always get, we always get comments of, "Well, you guys, you got you, you just gotta give it another chance. Once you get once you get 500 hours into it, it's really fun." No, I'm not dumping 500 hours into a game 
that I don't even enjoy playing for one hour. Yeah, once you reach level 100, you start being strong enough to be able to breeze your way through the game. I'm, okay, I'm not getting there. Yeah, I'm not going to get to that point. I'm like, they've, they've really improved stuff. No, I gave them a second chance and then a third chance. I'm done giving them chances. It's not fun. I'll probably keep on going back because I do want to see what there is just because it's a morbid curiosity at this point. I, I feel like anybody that likes the game at this point is because of Stockholm Syndrome. Possibly. Or, or sunk cost fallacy. I've put them a, much time into it. I must be having fun. I think there are people that have actually paid enough money that it's no longer a grind. It's not terrible. Because that's one of the biggest problems I have when I'm doing quests is that I just don't have the resources I need to properly do it. Mm -hmm. If you bring friends or if you bring in enough money that you pay, you could pay to win that game. You buy enough things that you need, buy these crates that have all the supplies. You can make the game easier for you. I can't turn the difficulty setting down on this game. So if I'm struggling, tough titties. Mm -hmm. I, I've said before that I think the only way that we could have fun with this game is if we bought the monthly what is it Bethesda one or whatever the yeah. fuck it's called mm -hmm. Bethesda first Bethesda first if we bought that and then just had our own server and then let fans join and play the game with us that's the only way I think we could have fun but I really don't want to give them any more money I don't want to pay 12 bucks a month for a game that's fucking broken and that I don't enjoy playing I don't want to encourage Bethesda to keep making these awful non RPG games that's not why I'm playing Fallout yeah I don't I don't think there's anything else about Fallout 76 i could say that we haven't said already or that hasn't been said it's just, it's not fun there's very few redeeming qualities i heard i heard the wastelanders update the free additional ad ad add-on content that's good and i tried it for four hours and i had a miserable time it wasn't fun i was lied to i i heard the same thing that the Wastelanders update made it a lot of fun. And then, I, again, I tried to play... When we were playing it together, that was when the Wastelanders update was out. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't notice any difference. I literally noticed no difference. But that's probably because I wasn't trying to build settlements. And there's another DLC that came out, if the free DLC, that involves the Brotherhood. And I don't care, because I'm tired of the fucking Brotherhood! Can you do something new with your game? Come up with a new fucking faction. You're in West Virginia, on the other side of the fucking continent. Come up with a new fucking faction. Why are super mutants in Fallout 76? Because why not? Because. There, there actually is a decent amount of enemy variety in Fallout 76, but they didn't stop them from rehashing old ground again. Yeah. They didn't need to put super mutants in there. You could have, it, it would have cost you zero dollars not to do that, and you did it anyway. You could have made a whole fucking faction called the Miners. They're, they're like fucking, they're based on like coal miners. Descended from coal miners and they've got fucking drill machines that travel underground. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Bethesda. I made the faction that you could have replaced the Brotherhood of Steel with. <laughs> it took me all of fucking 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, had fall, we had Fallout New Vegas. We saw like what they could have done. They could have improved on that. We saw the high highs the series could reach. And I don't know if we'll ever see anything like it again. Probably not, because it's too easy to do this. It's it's too easy to crap out garbage, and people pay us money for that. Yeah. And I think that's where the conversation ends, because there hasn't been a Fallout since 76. No, there probably won't be another one. They'll re-release Skyrim for the 8 millionth time. Yeah, they'll probably repolish up Fallout 3 or something in 10 years from now. Well, because the, the next games that are coming out are the new, the new um, Elder Scrolls game, whenever the fuck that gets released, and Starfield. And everybody, uh, once again, everyone's like, oh my god, Starfield, it's gonna be so amazing. We don't even know what the fuck it's about yet. Why would you have your hopes set high for Starfield after Bethesda gave you Fallout 4 and 76? Yeah, they're, they're, Starfield is gonna be a fucking hot mess. And you know what? If I am proven wrong and Starfield is one of the greatest games to, uh, to ever be released, I will gladly eat crow. Zach, you're finally in my camp. You assume things are going to be awful. That way you're pleasantly surprised when they're not. Mike, I've always been in your camp. Which is why Elden Ring is going to be a hot mess. No, it isn't. <laughs> because Miyazaki knows what he's doing. And if it's not, it'll be a pleasant surprise. I've seen, I've seen enough from people who are very trustworthy and who I definitely trust their opinion on FromSoft games. That is the only thing that I am like remotely excited about. But yeah, I have gen generally I am not excited about any games that are coming out. I 
I don't know why people are getting excited about Starfield. I feel like it's got it's going to just be a fucking hot mess. Mhm. It's going to be broken. Fallout New Vegas mods and some Fallout 4 mods are probably the best Fallout role playing experiences we're going to get. Yeah. I have no more faith in Bethesda. I've lost faith in them just as I lost faith in Ubisoft and BioWare and Konami and almost every other company. They've all disappointed me and I've got no faith in them. So I have no hopes for the Fallout series and I've got no hopes for Starfield and the entire future for the series looks bleak. But on the plus side, we, there's still like 50 really good Fallout New Vegas mods we haven't played yet. There's a lot of them. And a handful of Fallout 4 mods and a lot of pretty okay but not really that noteworthy New Vegas mods. So we'll have enough Fallout content for a long time. But man, the official content sucks. Yep. Well, on that note, have a good night, everybody. All right, bye. <laughs> Join us tomorrow when we talk about a more pleasant subject, like the Israeli-Palestinian. Oh, God. <laughs>